All right, we're back. Hey, Joey. Sorry, guys, I'm the tech support. All right, Joey will be right back here in just a second. Yeah, there we go. Yay. Sorry about that. It was, uh, you got to talk to the electrician. It was, you know, accidentally kicked the uh, plug that holds the fucking modem in. I was just testing you. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, what the fuck is this? All right, so as I was saying, I'm going to need a couple pee breaks and, uh, Drank too much coffee, you know? So what we're gonna start, I got a little slide presentation prepared. We'll start, uh, hit record. Okay, it's recording already. So we'll fucking, we'll start off with uh, I just general plant ID and then towards the end for anyone who's struggling. I mean, I talked for a while, so this will go longer than an hour. If you need to dip out, of course, just fucking do it. You can watch the recording later. Just hit me up for it. Uh, We'll talk about all the technical stuff and then we'll get into, I'll show a bunch of plant porn, just different photos of, I got a new Caledonia presentation. I got a bunch of shit from uh, um, the Southwest. And uh, oh, wait, wait, let me get this thing. Now I got a list of books too. So hopefully everybody downloaded INAC cause that's gonna be, that's gonna be your most useful tool. Uh, is looking at iNaturalist because um, you can use that explore feature. You don't even need to upload shit. You could just use that explore feature and, you know, all the taxonomies there, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, it's really, you know, especially if you're stuck in like a northern latitude where it's fucking, you know, winter, you can't go outside. You could still explore places like, you know, West Australia where it's summer right now, you know, or Chile or whatever, see what people are logging. A lot of, um, a lot of photos are shit on iNaturalist, but at least... You know, because people will take like blurry cell phone photos and only one. And uh, some guy just discovered a, like a new species or a species of rock daisy that hadn't been seen in like 50 years. And the photos he took were like blurry and fucking, you know, three feet back. It was, it was like, really? But, you know, you still get the name of the plant. And then there's a way to, you know, hit the view children button. Children is just, you know, the, the word they use for all the lower taxa. The, the, of, uh, you know, like a genus, if you're looking at a genus, it'll say view children, you hit view children, you could see all the species in that genus. But we'll get up to all that. If you don't understand what the fuck I'm talking about, that's fine. I'll, uh, every couple of slides, I'll stop and you can ask questions. Uh, please, everybody mute your, your camera too, if you can, because it's fucking, you know, if someone's puking in the background or someone farts or some, you know, someone's dog's barking or some shit, it's, it's very distracting. And I got, I got bad ADD already, so uh, mute your mute your mics, and then if you want to talk, you know, just unmute them and ask a question, whatever. So, um, but yeah, like I was saying, if you don't understand any of these terms, don't trip. You just, you know, take notes, write them down. You can watch the video later. Uh, the key, the thing I want to do is just put these words out there and and throw them at you, so you can look them up later. So you don't need to memorize everything now. Don't feel, you know, all the pressure. Like, I got to get this all down. What the fuck's he talking about? I don't understand. It's way over my head. You get the ideas, you get the keywords, and then you could just look them up later. And I mean, that's how I taught myself all this shit. You know, I mean, just anytime you encounter something, you don't know what the fuck it means. You just look it up. I mean, it's just, that's mental exercise, trying to understand new concepts, new ideas. The same way, you know, you got to do physical exercise to keep your, your ass in shape, keep your heart up. Uh, you got to do mental exercise too so you don't atrophy so your mind doesn't atrophy you know um so anyway with that we'll get started uh pardon grandpa while he figures out how the fuck did let's see share screen let me put this presentation up oh it's a fuck i'm using a mac this is my computer too i'm using a mac i can't uh oh god there we go plant tax and id we'll do share screen what 
Oh, just this, okay. How do I do it? Minimize this, and then, how the fuck? <laughs> you paid Zoom money just to watch some guy scream in a computer. How, uh, how do I full screen this? Jesus Christ. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here we go. You just gotta hit the full screen button. Okay, so this is there. They're seeing everything that's in the green. So for them, it is how do I? Screen. There's no way to. Do you want to? Oh, okay. They're seeing everything. Yeah. So you can do this. Um, okay go. so they're not seeing you guys aren't seeing anything but this slide i got up right can someone unmute and just give me a heads up yeah just you and the slide okay all right cool and if we get a shit poster or a troll then we'll have some fun with them and throw them out if i can you know get the adult back in the room to show me how to do it <laughs> okay, so this the, the thing I want to teach you all this, it's not just so you can impress your friends and know all the fucking Latin names and everything. It's so you can get a better understanding of, uh, of life on Earth. Because this stuff, the principles I'm going to try to show you don't just apply to plants. They apply to everything. They apply to you. They apply to your simian relatives, you know, chimps, <laughs> chimps and bonobos. Uh, they apply to, uh, to bacteria, to viruses, everything. So it's it's just the, you know, it's, it's evolution. It's this uh, still relatively new concept, only 150 years old. Uh, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, when you learn this, it makes, you know, whatever droll fucking world you're, you're, you're living in, you're immersed in, you know, whether it's cul-de-sacs and strip malls or, you know, something even more bleak, it makes it, you know, it gives you kind of a, a, a perspective on everything else around you, you know, everything else that's been here for the past 4.6 billion years of, of, uh, of earth history. So um, anyway, we'll start off with the fallibility of common names. You know, the reason I don't like to use common names, this is probably elementary for some of you, but it's because, you know, a word like cedar can refer to, refer to six different uh, unrelated plants. You know, it can refer to thuya, the arborvitaes, it can refer to salt, refer to salt cedar, tamarisk, it can refer to uh, juniper. And then you have the true cedars, none of which are native to North America in the genus cedrus. So common names can be confusing, like a plant like Turk's cap, for instance, can refer to six different plants too. They don't tell you anything. The point of using taxonomy and Latin names is that a species is connected to a genus, and then that genus is united, and we'll get into this again, by shared traits, both molecular in terms of DNA, but more importantly, things you can directly observe, like flower morphology. So I can be in a new place I've never been before and see a plant I've never seen before and know, oh, that's in the Verbenaceae, that's in the Verbena family, in the order Lamiales. And so there's these shared traits, uh, you know, so I'll know that it's probably got opposite leaves, it's probably got a, uh, probably a pleasant stench to it, you know, because that's the Lamiales is the order of mints, etc. So there's a lot, you know, once you know what are the, the traits that unite a genus or a family in or, or an order, you already know more about the plant you're looking at once you can place it by looking at its flowers. You know, you can say, oh, well, it's got so many stamens and the flowers, you can fold them uh, longitudinally, but not, not horizontally. You know, so it's bilaterally symmetrical. It's a good chance it's related to this, you know, and then, uh, you know, once you get uh, familiar enough with it, you get really good at it, you can, you can just automatically start IDing mm -hmm. stuff. You may not know what species it in, but it's in, but you'll know what genus, uh, and what family and order, et cetera. So there's a story there. And that's the thing I want to I want to get across is we use taxonomy because there's a story with every genus, with every family, et cetera. There's there's a bunch of traits that, you know, little footnotes in that in that uh, that name. So uh, anyway, these shared traits are called synapomorphies. All right. And, it, and that should be the first word. Write it down. Remem remember it. Memorize it. I mean, these are the shared traits that uh, that that unite things under a, under a taxon level, like a genus or family, whatever. So um, 
let's move on. You could read that, that this, this is because a trait evolves in a genus or family at a specific point in geolog geologic time. And if the trait is successful and adaptive, uh, that trait is then passed down to all later evolving members of that lineage. Now, of course, these traits can be lost later. Like if it proves, you know, you'll get like uh, Karyophyllales, for instance, the order of cactus, beets, spinach, ice plant, uh, the four o'clock family, they're all in the order of Karyophyllales. A lot of members of Karyophyllales, like 95% of them, uh, produce betalane pigments, which is a type of pigment. Once you learn what it is, you'll oftentimes be able to just tell if it's a betalane pigment by looking at it. That, you know, when you take a shit after you ate some beets, those red pigments uh, that you see that make you think you got colon cancer and you're dying, those are betalane pigments. Okay, they're the same uh, reds that you see in cactus or an ice plant or in bitter root. They're betalane pigments. Betalane pigments are a synapomorphy of caryophyllales, but not all families in caryophyllales have betalane pigments. Some lost them. They just didn't prove adaptive. A mutation occurred. Uh, that mutation, you know, was the loss of betalane pigments. And so, you know, they were secondarily lost. That's the, the word for it, secondarily lost. But generally, you get the idea, you know, that that trade is passed down and all descendants have it, you know. It's like I got a giant fucking schnoz. I could fit quarters in my nostrils. That's because my dad also had a giant Italian schnoz and he could fit quarters in his nostrils too. Okay, general general idea, just, you know, to make an analogy. So moving right along. How the fuck? Here we go. There you go. Synapomorphies, fuck taste. I did this last night. I put this present, this slide together when I was like running around a track typing on my phone. So typing's a seventh layer of hell for me. Uh, but anyway, there you go. New word. Uh, plant species are grouped together in genera. This is what we just talked about. Synapomorphies, etc. Moving right along. <clears throat> uh, here's some examples of synapomorphies. So like Asteraceae, and we'll get to this later, the sunflower family. A pseudo flower, a pseudanthium, uh, that's actually composed of many tiny flowers, each with a double branch style. Now, other families will do this too. They'll they'll make a they'll group a bunch of tiny flowers together to make it look like one flower because that's a, a better pollinator attractant. But nobody does it like Asteraceae does with the same arrangement of bracts, the same shapes, the same you know bifid double branch style that looks like a a Y, etc. Brassicaceae, the mustard family, four petals, superior ovary and glucosinolates, which are a chemical uh, that, you know, horseradish is a good example. It's like a, it's basically like a sulfur containing compound with a, a sting to it. And of course that discourages uh, animals from wanting to gnaw on it. So glucosinolates is an idea, it's, it's an example of a chemical synapomorphy. Um, You'll see a lot of numbers here. Onagracia, four petals, four sepals. You always want to pay attention to numbers, and we'll get into this too when you're looking at a flower and trying to figure out what the fuck you're looking at. Malvaceae, five petals, five sepals. Stellate hairs. There should be two L's there. Stellate hairs just mean stellate just means star shaped. So it's like a star shaped hair. It's a very particular style of hair or trichome that you'll see on a lot of members of a. Uh, the cotton family, you know, in fact, you look at, you live in California, you know, the plant flannel bush. It's called flannel bush because the leaves are covered in stellate hairs. And androgynophore, you don't need to memorize that word. It's just a type of structure, uh, a type of structure that applies to flowers. But, uh, you know, that's, if you see an androgynophore, like look at a hibiscus flower, you've got all those little, what look like little hairs at the top of a column in the center of the flower. And then at the top of that is the, the female part, the pistillate part, the stigma. Androgynophore, again, the word androgynophore is just a human way to think of this type of flower structure, the way that the stamens and pistil are arranged. But that particular type, if you look at like a hibiscus flower, the, the center of that, that androgynophore, that is, is specific to Malvaceae. Not all Malvaceae have it, but a lot do. And if you see it, you're looking at a fucking member of the cotton family, Malvaceae. Lamiaceae, bilaterally symmetrical corolla, opposite leaves, Volatile terpenes, you know, just a fancy word for this thing fucking stinks. It often smells pleasant, at least to humans. Uh, and inflorescence is a verticillaster. Again, verticillaster is just a, a form of a grouping of flowers. You know, you can look that up later. It doesn't matter right now. It's just often, uh, 
you know, if you see someone with a vertisolaster, there's a good chance it's in Lamiaceae or in uh, sometimes in Lamiales. Bodleia is in the order Lamiales, and that they have uh, often have vertisolasters too. Um, and we'll go through all the taxonomic levels too, you know, or at least the four you need to fucking remember. Ericaceae, blueberry family, inverted anthers. You'll see that with a hand lens. You know, you get one of these jeweler loops, like 10 bucks from uh, Jeff Bezos, who's creepy ass or wherever, you know, and those are, they're fucking great. They're cool just in general to look at anything. It's like a mini microscope, uh, you know, a, a low power microscope in your pocket. I carry one around with me all the time, but especially for looking at flowers, there's a lot of shit you can see that you, you may not see. I had a tiny tick on me the other day. Didn't bite me yet, but I couldn't figure out if that's exactly what it was or some other bug. Took out my jeweler's loop. Sure enough, it was a little nymphal tick. It was fucking gross. I set the fucker on fire and that was it. Uh, euphorbia. They have a cyanthium. If you see a cyanthium, it's in the genus Euphorbia, the poinsettia genus, um, often a three-lobed carpal fruit, etc. But again, don't be intimidated by all this technical talk, man, because you can you can look this shit up and teach yourself it. Homology assessment. Homology is just a fancy word for saying that two traits or the traits that two different species or genera have are that both those two individuals have those traits because of shared ancestry. Okay, again, we'll go back to like the big Dago nose that I have. You know, my half brother also has a big David, big Dago nose. Okay, it's because our dad had a big Italian schnoz and apparently that allele was dominant. <laughs> so anyway, the homology is just another word for uh, synapomorphy, kind of. They're, they're somewhat synonymous. The opposite of homology, which we're going to talk about, is homoplasy, which means that these two plants, and this is what we're going to, this is an important idea to understand too, convergent evolution. So homoplasy applies to convergent evolution. It's, you know, a great example people always use is cacti and euphorb, euphorbia, like the South African euphorbs which you'll see planted a lot in Los Angeles. You know, a lot of people see them and they think they're cacti. They look like cacti, but they're not related. Uh, they're not directly related at all. They've just both evolved uh, similar traits due to similar environmental conditions. And I'll show you some examples of this. Anybody got any questions so far? No? No. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice, clear. Thank you for coming. Okay, here we go. Convergent <laughs> evolution. We can't always assume, this is just what I was talking about, that two plants sharing certain physiological traits are closely related. Okay, this is what will fuck you up. People will always send me pictures. And, and on, on another note, somewhat related, people will send me pictures of leaves and be like, what is this? You know, and the dude's in fucking Asia or something. I don't know. I know. Send me a picture of flowers and I can tell you what it is. But just leaves. I don't know. A lot of plants have similar looking leaves. Okay. Sometimes you can look at leaves and be like, that's a fucking blah, blah, blah. But generally you need flowers. Anyway, we'll get to that later. Uh, but this is where things get fascinating. The convergent evolution, though it can be frustrating if you're trying to learn, uh, you know, plant taxonomy or plant ID, it can also be fucking fascinating. And this is what, to use the term, wet my whistle about evolution is seeing that two things look so remarkably similar, but weren't related at all. And why did they look so similar? Because the same environmental stresses that, uh, to use a somewhat uneloquent term, sculpt those traits out, the same environmental conditions existed in each respective plant's environment. Now by environment, I mean, I, you could talk about, you, you could mention climate, geology, herbivores, are part of the environment pollinators are part of the environment these are all stresses or or beneficial you know, what's the opposite of stress things that can accentuate alleles and and traits and plants so you know this whole idea the idea i want you to get is that the environment sculpts new species and can also cause the extinction of species so the environment is responsible for how plants evolve and what succeeds and what fails. Now, of course, we're part of the environment too and we're causing a mass extinction right now. Uh, you know, the KT meteor that hit 66 million years ago, that was, that was an environmental stress that caused a lot of extinction. But there's also, you know, the 
hummingbirds growing in an area in the in the Andes with a high hummingbird diversity. That's also uh, a part of the environment. And that what is what's the result of hummingbirds being abundant in your environment? You're going to start to evolve red tubular flowers, which insects can't really see. At least bees can't because they don't see that pigment, but hummingbirds do. You know, I mean, anytime you see a red tubular flower, you're like that thing's pollinated by hummingbirds. Maybe if it's in, you know, South Africa, there's no hummingbirds in the quote old world, but it's pollinated by a bird. It's pretty, it's pretty fucking cool. And these are the things that really, you know, get you, get, at least me, get me fascinated with the world. It's like everything is connected. Everything is influencing everything else. Um, so anyway, this is called convergent evolution. A great example. We already talked about cactus family and euphorbia family. Even better example, and this this fucking blew my mind when I see it, is this one. So this is a plant, Cephalotus follicularis. It's uh, from Western Australia. Grows in a relatively small area. I, I was there last the fuck was it, like a year and a half ago, October. These things are relatively small. They're like you know two inches at most. Just growing right on the this this embankment, this seep uh, near this estuary or bay. They look. Almost, I mean, to someone who's not familiar with botany, they look almost identical to this guy. Uh, Nepen- kind of look like Saracenia purpurea too. Right, same thing. If you want a, another example, all th- Saracenia, Nepenthes, uh, uh, Cephalotus, they're all, they're, none of them are directly related. They're all just morphological responses. Saracenia uh, is in, is that in Caryophyllales or Ericales? I forget. Either way, um, they're not directly related. These, these are both, this form, this morphology, th- these are things that just evolved uh, evolved on their own independently on each of these lineages. And what was the thing that caused it? A, you know, shitty soil, lack of nitrogen in the soil, you know, with any carnivorous plant. There wasn't enough nitrogen. And so, you know, maybe, uh, maybe a leaf, you know, at first started to curl and an insect got trapped in it or <clears throat> insect got stuck to it or whatever. And then that proved adaptive. That trait got accentuated. The plants that had that trait, uh, that mutation uh, thrived and the ones that didn't have that trait didn't thrive as much uh, or they went extinct. And so just these little baby steps, generally, sometimes they're big steps, but these little baby steps end up leading to this. I mean, you could look, this cephalotus even has that lip, you know, that rib lip, the peristome that Nepenthes had, this doesn't, isn't a great example, but there's some species of Nepenthes that have like a really prominent peristome with those ruffled ridges. This is Nepenthes vallardii. This is from New Caledonia. It's, a new, it's the only species of Nepenthes that grows on, <clears throat> on New Caledonia. This is a shitty photo because I stole from the internet. This is Trichocereus pachinoi, the one that all the, the druggies love, right? And it's <laughs> whatever your gateway drug is into botany, you know, I'm for it. You know, you, you see these guys who got like big cat, all their photos are just of like trico serious and peyote. All right. Okay. You know, try to get them looking at things a little differently, looking a little deeper, looking at plants that can't be used for psychedelic purposes. But anyway, trico serious uh, you know, looks exactly like this plant on the right, not related to it at all, not even in the same order. But again, they just re- evolved these similar morphological responses because they were the only green thing on the menu in an otherwise relatively comparatively barren environment. You know, these big photosynthetic organisms in an area with no trees, no big trees at least. And so they're gonna be the first thing that herbivores try to go on. So, or you've got this immense selective pressure of herbivores just gnawing anything down that doesn't have these spines or, or harsh chemistry. A lot of cacti have, you know, secondary metabolites chemistry in them, they produce compounds that, you know, like mescaline is a great example. Like, to, you, sure, humans can use it to, you know, have vision quests or experience uh, altered states, whatever. But if you're a rabbit and you eat mescaline, you're going to have a fucking bad day. And so that mescaline was a beneficial, the production of mescaline uh, was an adaptive trait for many cacti. Many cacti produce mescaline, not just trichocereus and not just peyote. Um, and peyote, the concentration is really high. And trichocereus is a little bit less, but even like some of the stenocereus produce mescaline, not in any really usable amount to a person, but, you know, and that brings up another point, which I don't want to diverge on this too much, but 
you know, some families in genera almost seem pre-adapted to evolve, not just once, but sometimes dozens of times, the same response to, you know, a fucked up soil or, or uh, uh, the same response to herbivore pressure. So, you know, this production of mescaline might have evolved, you know, a number of times in the cactus family. So it's not necessarily that, that, uh, that, you know, everything that has mescaline is directly related and shares a common, immediate common ancestor. Sometimes they just, you know, evolve it uh, on their own independently, you know. A gr another good example of that is the genus Streptanthus, which I got photos of later. Got some nice money shots. I'll show you Streptanthus, you know, in the genus Streptanthus, which is in the mustard family, that genus has evolved tolerance to the fucked up chemistry of serpentine soil like six different times, you know, and this has been, this has been figured out just from looking at uh, DNA sequences and comparing them. I mean, it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. So, you know, and I've talked to a, a, my friend, Tom Gibnish about this too. There's there, in some cases, there's all almost a pre adaptation, a pre adaptation, the genetic toolbox is already there and it just ends up working itself out over time. Another reason I love thinking about evolution is because, you know, when you think about evolution, you're just de facto going to be thinking about deep time, these immense amounts of time uh, that it takes for these things to evolve, you know, or for these relationships to evolve. Sometimes evolution happens pretty fast. Oftentimes it happens relatively gradually, you know, over many, many, many human lifespans. So moving right along. Okay, another great example of a uh, convergent evolution. You got Ocotillo. Anyone who's ever fucked around in the Southwest deserts in North America uh, is familiar with this genus, 12 species in this genus. Most people only know Fucaria splendens, which is the only one that grows in the United States. Here you go. Little uh, mildly succulent. It, dr it, drops its, uh, it drops its leaves in, uh, in it, you know, it's like drought deciduous which you explain that to someone who lives in Minneapolis or like plants drop their leaves due to heat too. No shit. And they survive. They're just adapted to that. <clears throat> yeah. A lot of forests from India to Mexico to wherever, you know, seasonally dry forests do this to Madagascar, et cetera, to Australia do this. They will drop their leaves and go dormant when it's just too fucking hot and rains, you know, not going to be arriving anytime soon. Anyway, Ocotillo, uh, you know, you can see these these spikes, the drought deciduous, red flowers, looks remarkably similar to another completely unrelated plant. Ocotillos or also in the order Ericales, the blueberry order. And I just call it the blueberry order, not because, you know, blueberry shares any sort of evolutionary novelty for this order, but just to get human beings uh, an idea of what, oh, okay, that's the blueberry order, they can, you know, connect it just to give them a mental connection to a plant that everyone's familiar with. So Ocotillo looks remarkably similar to this. Okay, I mean, to me it doesn't because I'm familiar with both of them, but to someone who's who doesn't know yet, maybe your grandpa or something, they'd be like, oh, it's an Ocotillo. I mean, no, they just, again, convergent evolution. Similar traits evolve in response to similar environmental stresses. This is Pacopodium. This is, I forget what species it is, don't really care. Not, I, I like them, but I just, until I see a plant in habitat, it's hard for me to get uh, enthralled about it, but regardless, this uh, this species I believe is from Madagascar. It's it's more closely related to oleander than it is to ocotillo, and ocotillo is more closely related to blueberries than it is to this uh, plant right here. Uh, before we go into this, anybody got any questions? No. Okay. Am I talking too fast? Or is any of this shit flying too far over your head? Don't be afraid to speak up. My job is to fucking teach you this shit, not to, uh, you know. All That's right. fine to me. All, All right. right. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I've got one. Uh, and maybe you're going to go over this later. But it, so it, if we're trying to use this in apomorphies to ID things based on family, but also families can look similar due to conversion evolution, um, how do you kind of get around that when you're, when you're trying to to use you know more plant morphology to to do an ID or at least identify a family. That's a good question, and I could be pissing in a bottle right now, and you wouldn't know it because I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> the well, that's just part of the uh, you know. There's there's books, there's books that you have to books help, but you know it, I guess the the idea with convergent evolution is you just got to look closer. Like with euphorbia, 
are the spines really the same? If you look close, are the spines really the same as the spines you see in a cactus? No. What is the base tissue? You know, if you look close, like I can look at a euphorbia and be like, that's a fucking euphorbia. There's maybe one or two times I've looked at one and been like, is that a fucking euphorbia or a cactus? Like there, I remember there, I was in the, the highlands of, not highlands, it was like 2000 feet of Oaxaca, near the Oaxaca Puebla border. And I saw a plant and I was, I knew it was a cactus because those big columnar euphorbia are native to North America. Uh, but I looked at it and I was like, that is fucking, it looks so much like a euphorbia because its spines were somewhat reduced. They weren't that long. Uh, the texture of the stem, you know, I was like, it was on a steep hill. I was like 12 feet away, but I was like, that looks so much like a euphorbia. The species name was euphorbioides, coincidentally. You, anytime you see that oides, it means looks like, like metasequoia glyptostroboides. It's called that because it looks like glyptostrobus, which is a related genus in the redwood family. But anyway, the point was, you know, most of the time, if you look close, you can be like, ah, you know, something seems off. Euphorbia, if you look at them long enough, you know, or if you've been looking at them for, or studying this stuff or just paying attention to it, eventually you start to pick up on those differences. The base tissue that spines are derived from in, in the euphorbia genus are stipules, which are like a type of bract that kind of protects emerging leaf tissue, okay? In cacti, the, the spines, people say cactus spines are leaves, not quite, they're axillary leaf buds. But if you look at them close enough, you could see the differences where they, where they are uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that, that bud tissue or whatever. So, and then of course, the way to get around it, and this is what I'm getting to here, the main way to get around it is flower structure. A, a euphorbia flower in no way looks like a cactus flower, completely different. So that's why I'll say, you know, this is the thing to get across too. And it, when I first got into plants, you know, it took me a while before someone told me this too. This is like 10 or 12 years ago. So I'm like, yeah, plants are generally grouped together on the way the flowers look. And this was a thing that got uh, Linnaeus in trouble because he was like, I want to group plants together and their fuck parts, you know, and how they look. And in Puritanical, when was it, 1600s or 1700s, whenever, that pissed a lot of people off, you know. Um, can you imagine being alive back then too? I would have been fucking beheaded 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, that pissed a lot of people off because that was like, that's the shit you're not supposed to talk about. It was, a, you know, really prude uh, square society, you know. Um, I The theory of evolution was still, you know, 200 years away. So, but, he, you know, he was the first one that looked at that and was like, okay, I see what's going on. Like, this is the one thing that's generally similar is flower structure because flower structures can't, they can't change too much, you know. Uh, and have things relate, you know, to, to, well, that's not a, the right way to put it too. I'm trying to say they can't, you know, if you, if you, if you get a big mutation in flower structure, oftentimes it's not adaptive. It'll, it'll cause that lineage to go extinct. Uh, when it is adaptive, then you get a new family or a new genus, whatever. But the point is flowers are what you look at, uh, not just leaves, you know? So like you wouldn't just look at, oh, it's a stem succulent with spines. I mean, you, you know, that'd give you hints when you look closer, you could look at the spines, tell the differences, but when that thing blooms, or if you get a fruit, even just a dried fruit, flowers and fruits, both, because every flower matures into a fruit. So either one of those, that'll give you a, that'll, that'll be the final word. And then sometimes that's not even enough. And that's where this shit comes, that comes in molecular phylogenies, molecular clocks, looking at specific gene regions, just think of it like barcodes, holding one barcode, up to another. Nice uh, reference from a consumer society, right? Holding barcodes up to each other. Genetic barcodes, that's what DNA is. Okay, series of ATCG, ATCG. Um, you know, there are areas, there are gene regions. Uh, you look at different gene regions to look at different levels of relatedness. Like are, are two species, you're comparing two different species in the same genus versus comparing, uh, two different families, right? So there's, if this flies over your head, don't worry. It's a fucking abstract thing to think about because you can't directly see it, but I'm just trying to plant the seed. So DNA is the final word. That's why a lot of things have been switched up lately. You might hear older botanists and horticulturalists talking about it. My friend Ken hates it. And he's like, I don't even know what they changed that genus to now. It used to be in this, I just call it whatever, you know? At least I know the species. The species will stay the same, but they'll change the genus name or they'll change the family. This is a great example. Yucca 
Joshua trees, yucca used to be placed in uh, the lily family, which is fucking insane. You know, you go back to like old taxonomy books 60 years ago, they were classified, some of them classified them in the lily ACA, which is like, you know, the lilies you might buy at the, the grocery store, which is insane. It was just based on them both being monocots, both having the same number of, of stamens and what was thought to be a similar flower arrangement. But then of course, I mean, later on people, people caught that fuck up before DNA came about, but DNA has really been in use the last 10 or 20 years. So that's why you're getting all these, these, these swapping, these switches of, uh, you know, this genus was in this family and now it's in this family because we, in, in many ways, DNA can elucidate, it can shed light on interrelatedness. And, you know, before DNA, all people had to go on was how things looked. And sometimes that wasn't right, you know? So uh, anyway, what this shit is a cladogram and why is it important to understand? So a cladogram is just a fancy word for a family tree. There can be different, there can be different ways to illustrate a, a family tree. It can be like, you know, 90 degree angles, uh, you know, branching like a family tree. It can be pyramid shaped, whatever. This one is a uh, pyramid shaped. This is just a prototype. Right? There's no plant here. It's just a prototype. The black lines are synapomorphies. Um, you know, so, and then of course you look up uh, at the top, you've got time on the left. So older, you know, lineages that are older or have changed or gone extinct. Well, if they go extinct, it's a dead end branch, but um, you know, they've morphed. They morph through evolution in the way that the, the environment causes things to evolve. So uh, this is a this is the way it looks. It, obviously, up by the letters at the top of the screen, that would be, uh, in general, today where we're at today with these lineages. But it, it's a cladogram. Uh, again, it's just a human way to think about how things evolve and how lineages evolve. Okay. So there we go. So here's here's the general list of tax taxonomic nomenclature. You got domain, kingdom, phylum, class. Don't even need to don't fuck yourself up thinking about all that. I generally only work with order down. You don't even need to focus on order now because that'll fuck you up too. If you're just getting started, just focus on family, genus, and species. Anytime you see a plant, you should be asking yourself, what family is it in? Instead of asking things like, oh, wait, what does it do for me if I make a poultice and put it you know, on my, my knee that I scraped? Or what does it do if I make a potion out of it and ingest it uh, you know, so I or sell it on Etsy for, you know, a hundred bucks for a skin cream. Well, if you got a hustle going on, I don't want to interfere with that. But the point I'm trying to make is, is uh, anytime you see a plane, you should be asking what family is it in? Because if, if you do this long enough, eventually you'll start to notice traits like, oh yeah, this is in the same family. I, you know, before I even looked it up, I look, I saw that flower and I was like, it looks like it's in this family. And I, it turns out I was right. Um, that's the big thing to take away, you know, is that what, you start to notice these synapomorphies, these traits that unite things. And that's what makes it fucking exciting because you can go to a, a shitty dirt lot, a vacant lot, or go to a fucking train yard or like be at a shitty shopping mall and look at their tacky landscaping. If something's flowering, you could be like, huh, look at that flower. Look at the way it's arranged. Look at the sepals, the petals. Why is it arranged like that? Why is it this color? Uh, why are the stamens and the pistil at different, uh, why are they different lengths? Um, and you can guess, you could start to notice things that, you know, oh, it's in this family. Wow. How about that? That's cool. That's a weird variation on a theme. You always hear me talking about in videos, variation on a theme. What the fuck is variation on a theme? I think it was, I forget who coined it. It might've been Darwin. I don't know. And the Darwin was endless forms, most beautiful, but the, the, I guess that's an emo band too, but I never listened to him. The point is variations on a theme. That's what really sparks the imagination of any biologist, you know, cause you get to see you're familiar with it to say you're you're really into saguaro cacti right you, you live in tucson or phoenix and you're like i love saguaros i don't know just something about them the way they look uh, the you know the, when they bloom and the bats like them and then the fruits and they're just fucking cool you know i just like i love the way they look in the landscape eventually your imagination if you're really into it will start want you know wandering to other different types of columnar cacti like neobucks vomia like what is Wow, that's a cool. I've never thought of it before. Neobux bomb is almost looks like a saguaro, but you know, it doesn't really branch. They just look like these green totem poles. That's weird. I wonder why it does that. Where is it from? What is it like where where it grows? You know, uh, 
down there in Oaxaca or central Mexico, wherever. So you, you start that imagination gets sparked and you want to start learning about, you know, you get curious what other forms have evolved over the last five or 6 million years, maybe less. I forget how old that cactus family's been in North America. Uh, I think it's primarily it originated in South America, but you know, what, what different forms have evolved over deep time, you know, it's fucking fascinating. And that's one thing that gets me stoked about exploring. You know, I can, I can walk up a barren hillside in the desert that someone who's not into plants might see and be like, wow, it just looks so dead and dry. And I'll walk up it and I'll see, you know, plants that have evolved. Their leaves are the same color as the fucking rock they're growing in. And that blows my mind. So it might be a genus that I'm familiar with, but I've never seen one that does this, that has leaves that turn fucking orange with speckled purple because they grow on orange volcanic rock. It's fucking wild. And you'll see the same thing uh, with certain snakes. We'll do that. Certain snakes. I mean, there's speckled rattlesnakes. It's a species in uh, the Mojave and Sonoran Desert. And uh, what's blown my mind about those fucking snakes, I mean, aside from almost stepping on them and getting bit, uh, is that each different population will come to resemble, you know, if you're on like purple rhyolite, you'll see purple speckled rattlesnakes. If you're on uh, grayish limestone, you'll see grayish colored rattlesnakes. It's fucking wild, you know? And you think about how long did it take for that trait to evolve, you know? And they don't change color. They're not like chameleons. Those are, those populations are that color because that lineage, that population has been uh, on that geologic substrate, the area where that geologic substrate occurs for that long. It's, it's really fucking cool to think about. And in a way it's almost philosophically fulfilling because you're like, this shit, this depressing shit, you know, everybody saw the fucking gravy seals invade the capital yesterday, the world's going to shit, pandemic, you know, half the fucking country doesn't believe in science anymore. You kind of come to realize this is all this temporary bullshit. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to let it soothe you too much. There's still a lot of need to, you know, to, to try to affect change, but it's philosophically soothing in its own way. You're like, you know what, uh, things are, generally going to be okay maybe not for me we're all going to die one day but just you know just broadens your perspective on the world around you and takes you out of this depressing synthetic world we've created so anyway enough of that moving right along uh this was uh, a quote by my friend dean who just died uh in november and it was basically his way because we were getting into this conversation like you know what is a fucking genius what's a family these are just things that humans come up with right we're humans trying to draw boxes and classify things draw boxes around and classify things that nature doesn't classify nature doesn't nature doesn't play by our rule our rules of taxonomy so in his way that he came up came up about it and you could apply this to family or whatever but a genus is a monophyletic clade which is separated from other such such clades other such groups uh by a substantial morphological gap. So that's just saying it's gotta be different enough from other genera um, to be considered a new genus, right? So in, in some cases, things aren't different enough. And so they end up getting lumped together in the same genus, whatever. And you end up pissing off a bunch of old botanists and horticulturalists, but it's just a way you gotta keep it loose, right? You gotta keep it loose when you're thinking about this stuff. Uh, kind of like how you gotta keep it loose when you're thinking about geology, like there's just, you know, you got to understand at the root, these are attempts of humans, of, of us fucking primates to put boxes around things that may not be as crystal clear as we want them to be. Uh, anyway, what the fuck, why is this not working? Next slide, here we go. What is monophyly and why is it desirable to group organisms this way? Okay, monophyly is, uh, just means if you have a monophyletic clade, it means everything in that clade uh, shares a common ancestor. So you have monophyly, paraphyly, and polyphyly. Monophyly is what you want. Paraphyly and polyphyly are ways to fuck things up, you know, when you're before you have uh, had it elucidated, the, these relationships elucidated. So, like, um, <clears throat> let's see, paraphyly, I'll get into this later too. I'll give examples of each, but monophyly is, is really what you want. It means everything in that group, in that genus, in that family shares a common ancestor. You're not leaving anybody out. Everything is a direct descendant of uh, the last common ancestor that they all shared. It's the same thing with P 
people, bacteria, fish. If you go far back enough, we're all related. You've got that LUCA, that last universal common ancestor. Okay, but anyway, sticking to a smaller scale, more recent, things are grouped together in monophyletic clad. So that's that's what you want. You want everything to be grouped together taxonomically on how on the ways in which evolution worked itself out. There we go. So here's an example of the flowering plant monophyletic clade, right? It used to be everything was just grouped in monocots and dicots. And then once we look closer, we realize you, you've got these magnoliids and some of these more basal angiosperms that are in, they're more closely related to monocots than they are to other flowering plants. So, you know, a good, here's, an, and here's the apomorphies, right? So uh, parallel leaf venation, if you look on that, that one black rectangle beneath monocots, you know, that's a good way to tell if something's not flowering, if, you know, if it's a monocotyledon or not. Monocots are grasses, palms, asparagus, agave, orchids, lilies. You look at the leaves of all those and the veins, <clears throat> you know, you got the, the light green leaf with the, the darker veins in most cases. The leaves are parallel, it's a monocot. So boom, you got one, one your one step, your one clue uh, closer in your detective novel of figuring out what the fuck that plant is. Okay, parallel uh, leaf venation. Okay, vasculature, attack. I don't even know what attack means, but these are all things obviously you can't see unless you, you know, get in there and dissect it in a microscope. Sieve tooth plastid, same thing. Um, you know, microscope for all that, but leaf parallation, leaf venation parallel, cotyledon one sends up one leaf, right? So if you grow, if I grow, grow an agave from seed, it's cool. You get one little leaf coming up, it just looks like a tiny little mini grass and then uh you know eventually it starts you get this rosette one another leaf forms to the right another leaf forms to the right they whirl around uh etc so you got monocots and then to the left of that you got uh amborella which i'll show you a, i think i put a slide of that in here you got amborella which is you know a really it's like a dinosaur it's like a living dinosaur a lot of people don't like that term but for all intents and purposes it works for people who are just getting into it uh it's a living dinosaur of plants, a living fossil. So it's a really old lineage. I mean, the way that, that Amborella transports water, the structures that it uses are so fucking different. They're more closely related to conifers than they are to the rest of flowering plants. So this is a really old lineage. Uh, I actually actually got one growing from seed back in California right now, collected seed of it, but it's, uh, you know, it's one of those, Amborella is one of those plants you're going to see every conservatory should have one every fucking uh, college greenhouse should have one it's a massively important plant uh in terms of the evolution of life on earth not just flowering plants but you know all life on earth considering that that you know plants are the base of the food chain uh nymphiales that's water lilies australbaleales that's uh elysium you know another kind of rare like star anise and pretty sure yeah star anise is in australbaleales you know used as a spice it's actually a really weird long lonely branch is a way to think of it a flowering plant evolution cool fucking plant too really weird flowers and when you get up and you look at these flowers you realize there's there's some differences there you know avocado is in loralis it's a magnolia again another kind of basal lineage is lineage magnolia same thing piper alleys peperomia uh, same thing, older lineage. It's, I mean, it's so the, the species itself is not left over from the fucking, you know, early Cretaceous, but the lineages. So the descendants, uh, you know, are descended from this really old uh, lineage this that evolved a long time ago or first emerged a long time ago. You know, if you look at like, a, look at like a, look at a magnolia flower up close, it'll blow your mind. It's fucking unreal. I mean, everything is arranged in this kind of cone-like structure. The, the stamens are, uh, don't have a filament. They barely have a filament. They're kind of like, they're not stocked. Think of like a lily stamen, right? Those antennas you got, we'll get into this later. You look at like a lily, those stamens are long. You know, if you got cats, you want to keep the lilies out the house because those stamens hold the anthers and the anthers drop the pollen and it's poisonous uh, to some animals. You know, those things that you, that, and they'll clip them off in lilies sometimes because of that. They can be poisonous to animals. Um, they'll clip those off. Those, think of, compare that to like a magnolia 
statement. I mean, get up close. Next time you get a magnolia flower, they should be blooming if you're in the South next couple months and look at it and you'll see how fucking weird it is. It's like, this doesn't look, it almost looks like a conifer. It's a really old, quote, old structure. And then on the right, you got the more recently evolved things, the asteroids, caryophyllales, which we just talked about, Santa lalies, uh, which is entirely parasitic, really cool fucking family all over the world. Mistletoes are in Santa lalies, et cetera. Anybody got any questions? I got a question. Oh. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier the importance of IDing or capturing photos of plants in habitat. The problem that I have is that some of the plants that I'm most interested in IDing are in habitats that are like heavily disrupted. So for example, I live in Oregon, west of the Cascades. We have a huge Himalayan blackberry problem. It's fucking everywhere. Oh, it's um, a terrible fucking place. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be in the woods and I'll come across like a clear cut patch of land and, uh, you know, it's like a few acres wide and it'll be completely grown over with invasives like blackberry and scotch broom. And I'll see like one presumably native plant sticking up out of the monoculture and I'll be like, oh, fascinating. What plant's resilient enough to survive in this sea of invasive species, but I can't get to it because I'm not going to get torn up trying to wade through blackberry bushes. All I can do is like take out my camera and zoom in as much as possible to try to get something clear like what do you do then? How do you positively ID a plant in that situation? Or are you just screwed? I don't know. You get some good boots, maybe. I don't know, machete. <laughs> some cases you can't, you know? I mean, blackberries really fucked. A lot of the hippies and permaculturalists, no offense, don't like Roundup or, 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 you know, herbicides. This is going on kind of a digression here, but man, there's no fucking way to get rid of some of these plants without using it. The idea is to not use mass amounts of it to spot apply it, don't use a fucking sledgehammer, use a scalpel. But you know, in case of Himalayan blackberry, you cut that thing, it's gonna sprout back up. So do you wanna go and, and wear gloves and dig the fucking root out, you know, and cut the shit out of yourself? Or do you wanna cut it and then, you know, spot apply like with a paintbrush, some herbicide? I mean, you know, yeah, habitats are disrupted. I, I mean, I've, I've almost killed myself, you know, dangling off cliffs to get pictures of flowers before just to, to look at them in some cases you can't you're fucked look for another try to look for another one you know try to uh i don't know i mean there's there's just ways it, there's only so much you can do don't fuck yourself up but uh you know in some cases there's just nothing you can do so but if you do get photos get photos of the top get photos of the sides get photos of the underside so you know if the petals are really big if they're bigger than the sepals you know you take one pit blurry picture head on you won't see those sepals sunflower family get pictures of the sides of it because Oh, a lot of members of the sunflower family just have yellow rays, right? They all look the same. You want to look at the, the phyleries, and we'll get into that later. The phyleries, those bracts on the side, uh, which can be in one series or in multiple series, those are the things to look at. Those can be diagnostic, the shape of them, whether they were curved or not, how many series you have, et cetera. So um, anyway, any more questions? Uh, yeah. Um, so when you were talking about related but not similar versus similar but not related types of plants, it made me think about ring species in animals, such as like gulls in, uh, in the Arctic, where nearby populations are able to interbreed, but once you get like a certain, like enough of a distance, they lose that ability. I was wondering if that's something that we also observe in plants. Uh, somebody else had said that they, uh, they, had see, they see it in like cereals. I was wondering if that's a common thing or like more rare in the plant world. If they see it in cereal, what do you mean? I'm not, I mean- Like cereal grain. Oh, I don't I don't know about that. I mean, I do know that there are, there's cases of like, you know, you take caranthodendron and flannel bush, right? Those things grow uh, a thousand, two, th 3,000 miles apart and they're in different genera. Different genera are not supposed to be able to interbreed. Caranthodendron and flannel bush can't. I mean, it's really just, nothing is, that's what I'm trying to say. Keep it loose when you think about this stuff because nothing, Nothing is solid, you know, things are, everything's subject to change, everything, you know, there's no definite rules. Rules can be broken, rules apply 95% of the time, you know, but then there's a case where it doesn't. So, you know, the idea of, and again, the, the idea that, uh, what's the way to think about this? That, you know, when gene flow breaks down, basically, um, you, you know, barriers to gene flow, sometimes, sometimes they're, you know, they're mountains, sometimes they're deserts, Sometimes it's, things just flower at different times, but nothing, nothing solid. Sometimes things can still interbreed, even though they've their lineages have been separated for, you know, fucking millions of years. 
So uh, I'm not familiar in the case with birds, but um, you know, I, I, the thing that the thing to take away is just like anything can really happen. I mean, that fucking corny quote from Jurassic Park: "Life finds a way." I mean, that really is the fucker was that whoever wrote that line for whatever that actor's name is. That's they were kind of right. So awesome, anyway. thank you. Yeah, hopefully that quite that answered. I don't know. It was kind of <laughs> kind of a rant, but uh, anyway. All right, so let's move on. Uh, so not desirable grouping, groupings, polyphyletic groupings and paraphyletic groupings. Now this can be really hard. Go way to remember it is paraphyletic. The word has an A in it. Uh, a can also, A is the first letter in the word ancestor. So paraphyletic, uh, a group that includes the common ancestor but not all descendants that derive from that ancestor. The most perfect example of this that you see in evolution textbooks is birds it's like reptiles if you say if you if you reptilia the order i've not, not even a fucking i should I'm not a herper but whatever the clade is for reptiles if you don't include birds in it because they're technically a reptile that's a paraphyletic clade you got all the ancestors and most of the descendants save for one or two so paraphyletic means you're kind of close when you're grouping these but you're not on the mark right uh, so paraphyletic, it's got an A, that word ancestor is the common thing, a group that includes the common ancestor, but not all descendants. Ancestor A, paraphyletic, also has an A, that's how I remember. Polyphyletic group, aka way off the fucking mark, you're putting yucca in the lily family, you know, or you're putting, you're putting paintbrush, Indian, Indian paintbrush in the, uh, the fucking, what was it, what it used to be in, scrofulariaceae or something? Way off the mark, right? I mean, they're in the same order, but you're way off the mark. So polyphyletic is groups that are not related at all, you know, and that's what the, that's what, that's where DNA comes in. That's where I, I that's when I like DNA because it really elucidates these relationships. It's like for so long, we thought because these things look similar uh, or similar enough that they were in the same family or genus. And then, you know, boom, it turns out when you look at the DNA test, uh, no, they're not, they're not related at all. You know, it's like the, the Maury Povich, you know, you are not the father. And then everyone freaks out, starts attacking each other on stage real nice. Good example, that's polyphyletic, right? Um, so those are the things you got monophyletic, paraphyletic, polyphyletic, monophyletic is desirable, paraphyletic is like, oh, you just need a slight adjustment. And polyphyletic is, you really fuck this up. You have no idea <laughs> what you're talking about. And here's the, cladogram example of each polyphyletic you could see e and g are presumed to be more closely related than they actually are it turns out e is actually more closely related to d than it is to g uh, and of course the idea here would be that you know e and d are placed in different are mistakenly placed in different genera or family uh whereas e and g are placed in the same family and it turns out boom that's way way wrong uh paraphyletic here you go good example uh this is the reptiles and birds thing. Okay. Say the B is all the birds and you know, you're calling a and I, J and K all reptiles, but you're not including birds. So that's paraphyletic. You've got the ancestor, but you don't have all the descendants. So here we go. Here's the juice flower morphology and terminology. So what to pay attention to when looking at them. So you can figure out what family or genus you might be looking at. Now, the best way to do this is not from listening to my ass talk about it or reading a fucking book and just studying on paper. The best way to do this is to go out there and challenge yourself by looking at weird shit, plants in a vacant lot, uh, plants in a conservatory, go sneak into the, the botanic garden, pay if you can, but if you don't, don't worry about it. It's, okay? it's like all that shit should be free in my opinion anyway, all right? Conservatories and fucking greenhouses and it should all be free. That's like the library. Uh, these are the books I recommend to people. Botany in a Day, not so much anymore because it's a good introductory guide if you're getting started, but it was designed for herbalists. Some of the taxonomy is off, but it really runs home the idea of looking at flowers. And, you know, each page uh, corresponds to a certain family, or in some cases, really big ass families like the sunflower family, it corresponds to a, a subfamily. So it'll help you get the idea. You know, I think I heard the guy who wrote it, it's kind of a prick. Uh, you know, he's, whatever, but you can steal it on LibGen. You don't want to pay for it. I would recommend the hard copy of any of these books though, because again, you want to give the authors some credit, you know, the publishing, whatever, the publishing will get some of the money, but if you have the money, get it. It's always better to look at a hard copy too. You know, I use this fucking tablet, this Android tablet. Uh, 
you know, cause you can download a lot of stuff on LibGen. You can carry 70,000 pages in what amounts to a, you know, a pound and a half device. But, you know, generally I like looking at hard copies. Flowering plant families gets a little bit more in depth. <clears throat> um, that's on LibGen too, but the fucking hard copy is awesome. If you can get it on used or I don't even, I might be out of print. This lady, I think she's in Georgia or something, but it's a great family and it goes into a lot of, not just morphological traits, but it, she even talks a little bit about habitats that they tend to occupy because certain plant families will tend to occupy certain habitats. Uh, and then plant identification terminology, if you know, you're, you're fucking yourself up trying to figure out what certain words mean. And it's a whole different vocabulary when you're looking at this stuff. But, uh, you know, the way to learn it, again, is not just by, oh, I'm going to open up this glossary and just start memorizing the words. The way to, to learn it is to go out there and read these descriptions of plants and then be like, oh, I wonder what this word means. Uh, and then look it up. You know, say you see a member of the sunflower family, you're trying to figure out what it is. Go to like a flora or a key and you, you see the written description of it and you encounter a word that you've never seen before. You know, like Pele and it's describing how the Pele look. And... Uh, you're like, what the fuck is a Pele? You go to plant identification terminology or look it up online, whatever. Boom, you just learned it. Not only did you just see the, it written down, but you saw an example if you're looking at a flower in your hand of what it is. So um, with this too, and I'll, I got another slide for this. The, the fucking Lord of all books is the book Plant Systematics by Michael Simpson. So these are all good, but Plant Systematics by Michael Simpson is really, it's, it's like a textbook. You can get it used. Uh, he just came out with a new edition. If you got the money, it's definitely fucking worth it. You'll be using it for the next five or 10 years if you stick with this shit. But it's also on LibGen if you're broke and, and just can't afford it right now. So, and he's a fucking cool guy. He's based out of San Diego. He just retired. Okay, so what to look at when you're checking out flowers? <clears throat> uh, numbers first, easiest, right? How many sepals? How many stamens? How many petals? How many styles? In terms of styles, most plants only have one. Some members of Caryophyllaceae have three, uh, which is pretty unusual for plants, but you know, it's a good way. If you see three styles, like, oh, this might be a Caryophyllaceae. Uh, whether the ovary, which matures into the fruit, ovary is just a fancy word for fruit, swollenovaries.com, is inferior or, or superior. These words, inferior, superior, I'll show you coming up in a couple slides, but it just refers to where the ovary is in relation to the point of attachment of the petals and sepals. And then also, you know, how the flowers are arranged. Uh, Cause you know, few plants will just send up one flower. It's always, they're always grouped together on a stalk. Uh, you know, it's a compound flower and inflorescence, you know, look at like the way in agave flowers, there's hundreds of flowers on like an agave Americana. Um, you know, you get that massive asparagus looking stalk that sends up and then it branches and it's got you know, flowers on each. I mean, look at, look at how it, look at the inflow. Don't, you know, stress, stress yourself out trying to figure out uh, what the name for the inflorescence is. Cause remember, it's just the human idea. It's just the human way to connect the flower structure, you know, consistencies and flower structures. Okay. Just try to remember what that flower structure looks like, how it branches, how the flowers are arranged. Do they droop? Do they point up? Uh, the mini stalks that branch off the main stalk, how long are they? Are they, are, is there one at all? Whatever. So here's flower parts, right? So this is, this is the, the thing that you got to learn. We're only going to focus on the diagram beneath the word flower parts and the diagram beneath the word flower sex. Staminate or pistillate. I just call it male and female because that's easy, easy word to use. It's easy way to anthropomorphize this. So you remember it easier. Same, same reason plumbers call certain pipes a male end and a female end of a pipe. So it's a really easy way to anthropomorphize things and think about them. So most flowers are perfect. They'll have, like, they'll be like this flower on the left where you got male and female parts in the same flower, but you go to like cannabis or you go to coyote bush, uh, which is in the sunflower family. Those are dioecious plants. Uh, they will either have, uh, they will either have, you know, the plant will be consistent entirely of male flowers or entirely of female flowers. You also have monoecious plants, which means monoecious and dioecious. The thing to remember is just all that means is the flowers are not perfect. They're not bisexual. So a perfect flower is synonymous with a bisexual flower. You have male and female parts on the same uh, flower. <clears throat> monoecious, you have separate male and female flowers, but they're on the same plant. Dioecious means 
an individual plant produces only one kind of flower, either male or female, all right? But like I said, I think like 80 or 90% of plants have uh, perfect bisexual flowers. In that case, this general structure we're looking at here under, under the flower parts diagram holds true. There will be variations on it. Some plants won't have any sepals. Some plants won't have any petals. Uh, some plants will have three styles, like I said, uh, whatever, but they're all going to have more stamens than they have styles. There's always going to be more uh, male parts than there will be a female part. And generally, there's only going to be one, one ovary. Uh, so the thing, this you, you memorize this structure, you'll always understand, you'll always be able to see it and, and pick it out and know what the stamens are on any plant. So we'll start with the stamen. Stamens consist of a pollen anther filament. Keep saying that to yourself. Pollen anther filament, pollen anther filament, like a nice prose, like a nice cadence. Just recite it yourself. Pollen anther filament. That's what I did. That's how I re would remember stamens when I was first learning this. I would see stamen. Okay, so you got the grouping, you got the word stamen, and then, you know, subtending that label, you have pollen anther filament, pollen anther filament. You say it enough times, it's like remembering a song or remembering, you know, a cadence of the way someone says something. Conversely, on a pistol, which the technical term is gynoecium, but you don't need to think about that now. A pistol is the female part. This is the way I remembered that when I was first starting was it's counterintuitive. You think pistol, you normally, that's a very phallic tool. You normally think dick or dong, whatever, but it's counterintuitive. You just remember it's the opposite. So yeah, pistol would make you think it's this. It's counterintuitive. It's, it's the female part. Uh, it's where the ovary is, et cetera. And it's also spelled differently. But anyway, pista is stigma style ovary. Say it a bunch of fucking times. Write this shit down. Stigma style ovary, stigma style ovary, stigma style ovary. And eventually, you know, you do it enough times, you'll be reading about plants till the pistol. Well, the pistol is arranged this way. Okay, what's pistol? Oh, yeah, stigma style ovary. That's the way that sounds, you know. And that's in subtending order from top to bottom. Same thing with pollen anther filament, subtending order. The pollen's at the top, pollen comes out of the anther. The anthers are those little banana shaped things at the end of the stalk. The stalk is the filament, et cetera. So you got stamens, you got pistils inside the ovary, you got the ovules. Ovules are just a fancy word for seed. You know, if you had a, a poppy bagel this morning, you ate some ovules, okay? Poppy seeds are ovules. Sunflower seeds are ovules. Uh, the perianth, the same way that a stamen consists of pollen anther filament, a perianth uh, is composed of petals and sepals. Petals are synonymous with corolla. Sepals are synonymous with calyx. But again, uh, you know, some plants don't have petals and sepals. Like you look at like uh, lilies or you look at like proteas, which will really fuck you up. If you're like Australia, Southern Hemisphere family, you know, you get them all over the South Africa, you get them in uh, South America, you get them in Australia. Proteaceae does not abide by this. The sunflower family does not abide by this diagram. There's variations on it. But I brought up proteas because proteas don't have petals and sepals. They have tepals. So again, this is just a human way to think about the way that these uh, floral attractant, these modified leaves that have been, you know, pigmented and turned into floral attractants are arranged. So it's tepals, if you can't tell if it's a petal or a sepal and they don't, they're not differentiated very much, they seem to just all be emerging from the same area, the same base tissue, then it's a tepal, okay? So you got petal, sepal, and tepals. Most plants, however, will have petals and sepals. The petals always uh, up top or, you know, uh, distal from the axis of the plant. And the sepals always closer to the axis of the plant, you know, where the, uh, that stalk that the flower is on comes from. So sepals are below, petals are above. Uh, petal corresponds to corolla, sepal corresponds to calyx. Okay, and these are all fucking important. If you're looking at like a, a, a sage flower, a salvia flower, the calyx ends up holding the seed. You've got this uh, superior ovary that kind of rests inside this calyx. The petals, the, you know, uh, senesce, they, they get old and fall off once that flower is pollinated. And in the sage, in most cases of the sage family, you have four ovules inside that ovary, which is nested in the calyx, you know? And the, the, the calyx in the sage family is often not very attractive. It's just a structural thing. It doesn't serve in attracting, attracting pollinators. So any questions on this?
No, all right. And if I'm moving too fast, you know, give me a heads up. Okay, this is the last thing to focus on uh, uh, with flower structure. So we're not, um, don't focus too much on biradial. Just focus on actinomorphic and zygomorphic, which again are just fancy words for radial. Can you cut it? If you cut it, uh, you know, across, can you cut it like a pizza or a bilateral? Can you cut it? like a heart, you know, you could fold it and it'll be symmetrical one way, but if you fold it the other way, it, it will not. Um, and this again, just will help. This is important if you're identifying a flower, like, oh, it's bilaterally uh, symmetrical. Good chance it's in the order Lamialis, the order of sages, just like Orobancaceae, Scrofulariaceae, uh, Lamiaceae, et cetera. These are, they all have, or Penstemons, uh, Plantagenaceae. These are all bilaterally symmetrical flowers they're all in the same order. Uh, people knew this before DNA, just by the way they looked. Of course, when we went and looked at the DNA, it was true. They were all, uh, they were, that was a monophyletic clay. They all emerged from the same ancestor in Lamialis. They were all related. Um, ovary fruit, ovule seed, we already ran through this. Ovary superior, fruit is above the point of attachment of the petal sepals. Ovary inferior, ovary is below the point of attachment of the petals and sepals. Again, don't fuck yourself up trying to remember this. You got to go see it in the field, you know? Ask yourself questions and don't, I mean, you're not going to, you're going to fuck this up at first. It's okay. It's fine. You know, the way you learn this shit is by making mistakes, but you also got to observe it firsthand. If you're in a place where nothing's flying right now, go sneak into the conservatory if you can, you know, or, or pay, pay. But if you don't have the money, try to try to sneak in. Because again, all this shit, in my opinion, museums, libraries, all that shit should be free. If you have money to support those institutions, do it. But at, at its root, this shit should be free. No gatekeeping. Uh, here's examples of ovary inferior and superior. Forget about hepanthium now. We don't need to memorize that. You know, and of course, there's variation. Sometimes the ovary is like halfway up. The, the sepals and petals are attached halfway or whatever. It doesn't matter. Just focus on inferior or superior. Is it above where the sepals attached to the stalk or is it, is it, is it below? Different types of inflorescences. Again, don't fuck yourself up trying to remember these. Go observe them in the field and ask, what the fuck am I looking at? What would you call this flower structure? Okay. You got spikes. A lot of orchids uh, produce spikes. Uh, racine, corims, umbels. Umbel, everything in the carrot family produces an umbel, but it's not only an umbel, it's a compound umbel like you see down here. So it's an umbel of umbels. All right. You got two different uh, layers of, of branching right there. Okay, now this is where shit starts to get interesting. This is totally different from everything else. Sunflower family is different. I, you know, I, I'm always ranting about Astraceae. I fucking love it. It's everywhere. They're so cool. They're so adaptive. Uh, you know, they're, they're the most ecologically successful plant family on planet Earth right now. Uh, you know, orchids have more species, but orchids uh, are mostly at lower latitudes. Um, so what's going on here? You got a ligule of a ray flower. You got two different types of flowers, disc flowers, ray flowers, okay? It's not that this might seem intimidating at first, but it's not once you get the gist of it. You got disc flowers and ray flowers, okay? And you got receptacle scale, AKA the palea, uh, receptacle, I don't even use that word. I just say capitulum or capitula, plural. And phyleries, these things that are diagnostic and figuring out what species you're looking at. On the right, you see a diagram of both a disc flower and a ray flower. Um, this is really, this was a, a, a massively adaptive trait when this evolved. And the whole order, Astoralis, not just the family, tends to have these compound flowers. And not only that, but tends to do secondary pollen presentation, which uh, sunflowers do. So those styles, those little Y shaped, looks like a bent Y, right? With its branches bent back. Those emerge, they are functionally staminate first, they produce. Uh, male flower, they, they produce, they put pollen out first uh, and then they become receptive to pollen afterwards. Uh, but this was so adaptive because it's a way you're grouping so many flowers together. And because of the way that the flowers mature in the disc, that there's always a, this thing, the single flower head, the capitulum will be blooming in some cases for a fucking month, you know? So as the flowers on that, they start at the outside, those mature first and on the inside, those mature last. And always throughout that month, you know, there will be a flower 
uh, presenting pollen and being pollinated. So ecologically, they're providing nectar and a sugar source for insects, and in some cases, birds, for a really fucking long time, you know, whereas some flowers only bloom for a few days, sometimes only a night, like saguaros only bloom for a night. Uh, so this is massively important for the fucking food chain, but also this is such an adaptive trait because it's, you've got so many, I mean, one flower head can produce sometimes thousands of fucking seeds, right? So you've just made a thousand uh, offspring. And not only that, but we'll get to this. Unfortunately, this doesn't show it, but you know, that dand, oh, this does, the, the ray flower does. Well, they both do actually. See these elongated spikes at the bottom? So you got, look at the flower. Everyone's still with me? Yeah. So you got these flowers on the right, right? You got a disc flower, you got a ligulate flower. At the bottom, you have a seed, that, that you know, little comma shaped thing. And then on top of that, you have the pappus. Okay. Pappus can also apply to grasses. Um, I think, yeah, that's right. Anyway, the, but in the terms of Asteraceae, the pappus is that that dandelion fuzz. It, was, it's, it acts as a dispersal mechanism. Sometimes the pappus has been modified to stick to other animals. And then, you know, later it gets brushed off somewhere and dispersed somewhere else. You know, in the case of uh, a lot of members of the sunflower family, it's it, uh, it picks up wind currents and it gets transported somewhere else. You know, so, I mean, you've got, you're producing tons of seed and you got a way to get them around. They don't just fall and drop on the ground. So this thing, that's why this family is everywhere. And a lot of weeds, a lot of non-native weeds can be members of the sunflower family too. So the thing that's really weird, and this is hard to, to, to grasp right here, is that unlike most, most members, if you look at that diagram on the right, most flowers, you know, you got uh, stamens, pollen, anther, filament. Okay, that's easy to grasp. I get it. Kind of looks like a bug antenna. In the case of the sunflower family, though, these have been the anthers have been fused together. The filaments, the stalks that hold them, are not fused together. Uh, they're free, and you've got this structure. You can never see it unless you have a hand lens. You can't ever really see the anthers on a member on a flower of a member of the sunflower family, except for the one I'm about to show you, because they're fused together and inward facing in this little tube. And so this style, this is the secondary pollen presentation I'm talking about. This style comes up in between that fused anther tube, pushes the pollen up, presents it, and then once it's been removed, then it branches out and opens up and becomes receptive. So this is a massively adaptive trait, but it also makes them hard to study because, and it really fucks people up when you're looking at them because you can't really see what's going on. Except in, where the fuck, oh, I don't think I put it here. We'll go, we'll get here really quick. Except in ambrosia. So ambrosia is one of the few, uh, clades in the sunflower family that's wind pollinated it's not pollinated by bugs so what good would it do to just have a, a fused anther tube and then have the style push them out right also these flowers are not bisexual which is odd for the sunflower family too they these you know ambrosia is such a fucking weird flower structure these are the ragweeds these are what irritate everyone in the spring and and through summer into fall massively because they're wind pollinated they just dump out tons of pollen tons of plant sperm to just you know irritate everyone's uh, uh you know make them sneeze like hell itchy eyes whatever so these are anemophilus they're wind pollinated so because of that they don't want there'd be no point in having a, a fused anther tube that's not going to be an adaptive trait these have five these have evolved so that that anther tube is no longer fused and the anthers are free and so you can get a the thing that's important here is it gives us a close-up shot of what's going on with Asteraceae anthers. I mean, this is one of the few clays in which you can actually get up close and see the anthers. So these are all staminate flowers down below, not in the photo, or where the female flowers would be, the uh, pistillate flowers. But it's it really it's it's a cool example to see one of the few cases where you can actually see uh, this family's anthers without a hand lens. So any questions, real quick? No, no. Uh, I, have, I have a quick question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so it, do you know of any books that are just that the whole focus is on the Asteraceae family? Oh, yeah, there's a shit ton. There's one online. Uh, and I, I used to have it on that Google Drive thing that I would give out. But it's like a thousand page book. It's like it's great, though, because the photos in it are fucking awesome. It's in PDF form, too. 
Vicky Funk, before she died, sent me one, but it's also available online. You could try Googling all one word comp book for distribution. Comp is in composite, another word for the family, composite flowers. Comp book for distribution, PDF. <clears throat> it should come up, or if you email me, I can send you a copy. I can email you a link to a copy later, but that really gets into it. And there's, you know, there's each chapter is like designated towards a different order or family or, or different subfamily or, or tribe, whatever, but it's got a great glossary in the back, et cetera. There's also another book called uh, Sunflower, The Sunflower Family in North America, which was put out by Botanical Research Institute of Texas. Uh, they have a publishing company. That's a fucking great, that's a great book too. Um, and it, I think it just came out a year or two ago and that covers every genus in North America and talks about habitat and, you know, synapomorphies of, of every genus and tribe. It's, it's a great fucking book, but those are two to start. Yeah, no. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just, I'm tired of overlooking them. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I, wanna... I know. I used to just ignore them. And then I, I was like, I got to fucking figure these out, you know? And when I did, I was like, holy shit. And you see some of the South American ones and they're not just these boring little yellow daisies anymore. They're a lot of them are pollinated by hummingbirds. They're like, radically colored they're just the most fucking bizarre things go to like look at the tar weeds on hawaii look at like uh i mean some of the other some of the other asteraceae you know all over the world they're like south africa there's members of senecio which is a weed here of the senecio tribe that are like 30 foot tall trees on mount kenya you know equ equatorial highlands at 16,000 feet i mean when you see the variations on a theme that evolution's produced in this family, it, that's when you'll kind of get hooked. You're like, this is fucking wild, man. Holy shit. So it's, the, yeah, they're cool, man. But always get pictures of phyleries when you're taking photos and pictures of phyleries and leaves. Because, yeah, a lot in North America, at least a lot of the flowers look the same. Sounds good. I'll be using iNaturalist to, because that, that that seems like one of the only things that, uh, like if you take some really, really detailed pictures, that's, that's where I've had most of my luck identifying most of just those, you know, those DYCs. Yeah. 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 And eventually, you know, you're into them long enough and you start to notice, like you, you'll be able to look at a flower and be like, Oh, that's probably in this genus, you know? So, yeah. Cause there's yeah. apomorphies on every level, genus, subfamily, tribe. Yep. Et so uh, anyway, um, we already talked about all this stuff. Here's a nice money shot of uh, an encelia flower, brittle bush. Uh, in the deserts, you know, super common plant, successful plant in the deserts of North America. You'll see them growing on the side of the fucking road in, in uh, Arizona, southern Arizona. The reason they grow on the side of the road is because they get all the immediate runoff whenever it rains. It acts as like a little feeder tube, a little funnel, just funneling of moisture. Um, and here, right here, you can see the individual flowers. See, the ones on the outside matured earlier than the ones on the inside. The ones on the close to the center of the flower haven't even opened up yet. Those Fused anther tubes have not even opened up yet. You got the purple corollas, five lobes. So what would be petals are all fused together in this tube. You got an anther column poking up out of that tube and you got the flowers maturing cent cent centripetally, um, centripetal maturation. So this thing, these things will bloom for weeks, man. They smell great. There's a cool resin you can scrape off the stems. Um, which is cool too. I mean, it, they were used as incense for a while by a lot of the Spanish uh, missionaries when they were committing genocide, you know, for the churches, for the good Catholics, nice, because that incense smells good when it burns. But you can see, I mean, right here, I mean, look, you can see the individual pollen granules on those outer flower, those outer florets. So that's the other thing is the actual flowers are called florets and the florets are grouped together in a capitulum. Uh, always give photos of phyleries. Here's the phyleries. This is a case in which it's diagnostic. This fucking flower, this species is, in, is a Texas endemic, South Texas endemic from the sand sheet. Uh, Helianthus praecox, I think it's a variety or subspecies runyonii. You know, very, you can see the, the fucking phyleries right there. I mean, the, the way they're so elongated, spiky, the way they were curved. This is Nicoletia trifida from the deserts of Baja. This thing smells amazing, like all members of the Marigold uh, tribe. And it's also got these really bright colored, and other species in Nicoletia do this, have these really bright colored 
uh, ligulate, ligulate the flowers, ligules, the kind of candy cane thing. Vernonia larciniae, this is from near Sanderson, Texas. This fucking thing. If you know Vernonia, aka the iron weeds, you'll see them in the Midwest, you'll see them on the East Coast. They're, they don't look anything like this, man. They're fucking crazy. They're really brightly colored. The Corollas are like bright magenta. Uh, and they're green and they got leaves. This thing almost doesn't have any leaves. The leaves are tiny. It grows in the desert. Of course, if you live in a desert, you don't want to have big surface area leaves to transpire all that moisture. You're going to reduce your leaves. You're going to eventually evolve white hairs that cover them. Uh, this is a pretty rare plant. It's from northern Mexico and south Texas in the Chihuahua Desert. When I saw this, I was fucking stoked. I got a bunch of seed of it and then I fucking lost it because I didn't miss, I didn't label it. So anyway, go back. Already went to this, the ambrosias. Some of the ambrosia, this is ambrosia camphorata in, in serpentine. And this is a relatively rare plant in Baja, California, sir. Ambrosia trifida, if you live in Texas, uh, is an annual that gets upwards of 25 feet tall in a single season. I mean, it's like fucking bamboo. It grows so fast, um, but the same flower structure, the same flower structure, different leaves. Trifida, because it's got trifid leaves, it's got three lobes to those leaves, but it's definitely a plant you know, it goes unappreciated because it causes hell for people with allergies and it's just the roadside weed. Uh, but here in North America where it's native, it's a plant you got to, you kind of got to give some respect to because it's so ecologically dominant and, uh, you know, the, I'm sure a lot of things munch on it too. So anyway, we already talked about this certain families. This is how you really get into it. Don't just try to memorize all this shit at once. Find something you're, you find really cool. Say it's saguaros, say it's fucking uh, sunflowers. Probably not going to be, but <laughs> most people aren't thinking of some of those. But, you know, say it's uh, 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 members of the four o'clock family or say it's like the mustards, like they're really weird. The fact they grow in all this fucked up soil uh, is odd. You, and you just roll with that. Just focus on that. Don't try to learn everything. Focus on that. You'll get stoked about it. You'll want to know what are the different variations on a mustard or the different variations on a columnar cacti. For me, when I did this 12 years ago, it was conifers and it was cypresses. I was like, this is so weird. The way that California cypresses grow, there's, you know, a lot of them only grow in these small geographic areas, often on really fucked up soil. And if you go to an area where there's a cypress growing, uh, there's also probably going to be a lot of other weird endemic plants, rare plants too. So that, and then that kind of, you know, I'd be in the cypresses, I'd kind of nail them down. Then I'd be like, oh, this other thing that grows with them is really weird too. Huh. And then I'd look a little bit closer and just have my mind blown and get, get stoked on it. So plus again, pleasant distraction from the fucking harsh reality of uh, the modern day, just studying life. So anyway, that's more what I just said. Uh, so how do species evolve? Is everyone, people getting too bored or is this good or what? You want to just look at some plant photos or what? It's good. All right. Cool too. Fine. Okay. All right. Uh, there was like a California answer. It was like, it's cool, but it'd be cooler if it was <laughs> no offense, but I'm just saying, if you want me to look at photos, we can go to photos, but this is the, the how species evolve is pretty fascinating too. Um, but I'll, I'll try to speed it up a little bit. So how do species evolve? How do you get these different variations on a theme? Uh, you get allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric's the most common. Species become separate. A population becomes split in two by a mountain range or an ocean or a desert or whatever. Uh, sympatric speciation, a population is doesn't get split in two. It doesn't get geographically separated. So you get a different pollination time. They evolve a different phenology. This members of this allele, this allele arises and it causes these individuals to bloom in the spring and these individuals to bloom in uh, the fall. The idea though is you get a, a, a decrease in, or elimination of gene flow between the two populations. Okay, so you're not exchanging genes and alleles anymore. You've got two different uh, populations and those eventually evolve into new species. Okay, but vicariance barriers like mountains or oceans or deserts, that's the common way that uh, things speciate. But you can also get dispersal events as happened with the Hawaiian silver swords and the tar weeds. So Hawaiian silver swords are most closely related. The plant they're most closely related to on the mainland are the tar weeds. These like weedy little, really glandular resinous. They're called tar weeds because they're sticky as hell. I think they smell good. But again, that, that 
the, that resin they produce, those really sticky glands, almost like cannabis, the point of that is to prevent things from eating them, to get bugs stuck to them, whatever. You know, the bugs will crawl in that and they'll get stuck, can't move, right? So that's a really good adaptive trait to, you know, keep yourself alive so you can produce offspring. Um, so they, they, at some point, one of these seeds or maybe a, a few dozen seeds got brought to the Hawaiian island archipelago and you can actually we've actually dated this at five or six million years looking at molecular clocks which is a whole other concept to get into but a really cool one if you have time you should try to teach yourself it uh five or six million years ago one of these seeds got brought to the hawaiian island archipelago and because of the way that plants speciate on islands where uh you don't want seeds that disperse that are that are wind blown and get picked up on a wind current because they'll just get brought out to sea to sea right so there's going to be a selective pressure to evolve bigger seeds without a dispersal mechanism on them. Uh, you can also, in most islands, there's no herbivores there. Like in Hawaii, there were no large herbivores there. So you could you could afford to grow big. Uh, the, the same mutation arises that causes the, this individual to grow larger than this one. That on the mainland, that individual with that mutation might get, that's a big red flag a big flag to herbivores, they'd gnaw it down, it wouldn't survive. But on an island, you know, there's benefits in growing big too, because you can make more nutrition for yourself, you can more service area to photosynthesize, uh, you got more carbohydrates stored. So it that what was a maladaptive trait to get big and, you know, become noticeable to herbivores on the mainland is now an adaptive trait on, a, on an island because there's no herbivores. So now these things grow bigger. The ones that don't grow as big uh, over time just kind of get filtered out. They don't make it. They don't produce as They're not as successful. So from this tiny little fucking roadside weed that grows in California evolved this thing that lives now lives 30 years. Most tarweeds are annuals. They only grow for four or five months, produce a ton of seed and die. Evolves this thing in Hawaii that can live for 30 fucking years, get eight feet tall in some cases, uh, has these like really bright blue fuzzy leaves, grows on tops of volcanoes at high high altitudes and just looks nothing like the thing that it evolved from. And it's immensely successful on these volcanoes where it grows. It's, you know, and how long did it take for that to evolve? A few million years, whatever. Um, you know, this is the, the idea is you get this, evolutionary fork in the road, the separation of two populations. And it can be because the seed was dispersed by an animal or mountains arise or continents separate, plate tectonics, etc. This is fucking unrelated. I just thought it <laughs> I just thought it was cool. This is why a lot of plants out west will be fuzzy and a lot of plants in the east will not. They'll have green leaves with few hairs on them. And this is because uh, of this this is a this is a factor that causes that is you get much more humidity east of that hundredth meridian, which you could see running through central Texas where it's greener, um, and that's what causes the diurnal variation in temperature. The diurnal variation in temperature corresponds to humidity because humidity water vapor holds heat longer. So you don't have much of a variation between day and night in Florida in the summer because there's so much fucking humidity you could practically spoon it into your lungs. You know, it's not going to change that much. You might get 10, 20 degree difference. But you go to the desert, go to like Death Valley, it'll in the summer, obviously it's a fucking 115 degrees in some cases. It'll cool down to sometimes the upper 70s at night. So you've got like a 45, a 35 degree uh, variation in temperature, in some cases much more, you know. And this is something you get in highland tropical areas too, like Mount Kenya, where you're at, you're getting the full brunt of sun. You're at zero degrees uh, latitude, but you're getting the full brunt of sun because you're at 17,000 fucking feet elevation. So it will be, it'll get upwards, you know, what? I've never been there, but say 70 degrees during the day, then it cools down almost below freezing at night. I mean, that's a huge stress on plants, but again, evolution being what it is, they adapt. So, you know, same thing in like Columbia Highlands. I mean, you just get wild shit that happens, but also, Knowing this and how plants respond to this effect, this diurnal variation in temperature, as well as humidity, uh, you can see a plant you've never seen before. And if it's blue and it's got fuzz, boom, you know that plant is from a dry, uh, arid environment. Doesn't matter if it's Australia or South Africa 
or or the de the deserts of northern Africa or whatever. I mean, you could see that and be like, wow, that's that's from a dry climate. Really fucking cool because the the moistures or the the those hairs keep that moisture in. They keep the ultraviolet radiation from battering uh, the leaf tissue and getting the leaf tissue too hot because it you know at certain temperatures photosynthesis shuts down. So uh, just another cool thing to pay attention to. Dispersal events already already talked about that. And this is my favorite shit. This is what I'm really into. Plants also speciate. Oh, this isn't, never mind. These are just different factors. But at the last one, the last factor here, especially soil type, right, can cause plants to speciate. You got serpentine, limestone, gypsum, each of these soil substrates. And this is, a, this is what's fucking cool because this shows you how much geology affects evolution of plants. Things most, most people don't ever pay attention to. When I see a new plant, anytime I'm in a new habitat, I, I try to figure out what the rock is, you know? And you only got, I mean, crash course in geology, you only really got three main different types, right? Igneous, is it volcanic or is it like granite? Did it cool from a magma or is it metamorphic? It was uh, altered at some point, i.e. cooked either by magma or by being buried at really great depths. Or was it sedimentary? You know, just sediments accumulating over millions of years, like limestone or, or sandstone, et cetera. So these soil types, you know, or dunes, in the case of dunes, can affect how plants uh, speciate and evolve. So you'll go to areas that are, the geology is gypsum. You only find gypsum endemic plants there or plants that can tolerate it. But the gypsum endemics, you won't find growing anywhere else, you know. And to see what effect that geology has on plants is, fucking mind-blowing and, and really cool so uh in places with uh more homogeneous uh, uh geology and i can see too much of this you know like in the midwest growing up it, it was always it was all limestone and that limestone was buried beneath 40 feet of topsoil in some cases i couldn't really study it as a kid or pay attention to it you know unless i was driving by a limestone quarry but in places with more diverse geology you notice the stuff and it's you'll start to notice the differences man you'll you pay attention you'll start to be able to figure it out so we'll go we'll roll through uh oh, one more fucking slide on this okay well, go ahead the go geology ahead. what's the geology app that you mentioned a few videos videos ago you got iNaturalist and then you got geology app that connects you to papers on your area oh yeah rocked r-o-c-k-d yeah it okay. connects, it's a it's a geologic it's a usgs overlay like a geologic map overlay of wherever you are so that's a good thing to have too. It can be buggy sometimes and frustrating, but overall it works out pretty good. Um, you know, does that, does that only work for the United States? No, no, I used it in Mexico. I used it in Australia. It depends what their source of information is. You know, in some places it's really general. Like when I was in Mexico, you'd have these huge areas that were actually quite buried, but the whole area would be grouped as, you know, Cretaceous metamorphic rock late cretaceous metamorphic rock right whatever not very helpful but in some areas you know it's really really uh you know like in texas some of it's like really these maps each different type of rock is color coded on the map it's really helpful i mean you can see you know it's it's really uh articulate in other words so that's a good one to have too and then if you want to learn geology more i mean the easiest way to do it yeah you could read john mcphee books you could do whatever but really the easiest way to do it uh, John McPhee was like a pop science writer for geology, but the easiest way to do it is really just, you know, watch geology videos, uh, you know, and more importantly, get like a used geology textbook. Like geology overall, unlike plant taxonomy, has not changed that much in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So, uh, you know, you get an old ge geologic textbook, you can find them probably online, 10, 20 bucks. You could download them on LibGen. Essentials of Geology is a good one. You don't have to take the whole thing in, just get the base elements. Now, what are the three different types of rocks? How do you pay attention to it? Okay, you got igneous and then subcategories of that. Igneous, you know, cools from a magma. You got extrusive igneous rock and intrusive igneous rock, right? Well, how do you how do you tell which is which? By looking at the grain size, AKA those crystals, the shimmery bullshit, as I call them in my videos of like basalt, like basalt, you look close enough, you see little shimmering, those are the crystals, that's the grain size, the crystal grain size, uh, and that cooled, the reason those crystals are there is because it cooled from a magma. If it cooled uh, relatively fast, in the case of basalt, they're gonna be small. If it cooled over a few million years, 
in the case of granite, like you go to Joshua Tree National Park, these are the geology there uh, is these massive granite plutons, these masses of fucking rock. The whole, you know, the whole area was a mass of rock, all relatively similar in uh, in chemistry that cooled immensely slowly, like over millions of fucking years deep underground. Because it cooled so slowly, there's a larger grain size. Those crystals had time to grow. You know, like if you make rock candy, it, th you, it takes time for those sugar crystals to grow. So the longer, the more time you give it, the more homogeneous conditions you give it, like temperature and depth, for a longer amount of time, the bigger those crystals are gonna grow. Those gypsum crystals in that cave in Mexico were at the perfect conditions like 58 degrees Celsius groundwater. They pumped the groundwater out to get in there, but it was 58 degrees Celsius groundwater, really uh, gypsum and, and, and sulfate rich groundwater. That, and it stayed like that for estimated like 500,000 to a million years. And that's why those crystals are like 20 feet long in some cases. And eventually when you know people abandon that cave, it'll fill back up with groundwater and theoretically they'll keep growing. So um, anyway, that's igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, I mean, same, you just learn the look of it. I know that sounds ridiculous, but you'll see a sedimentary rock like a sandstone and uh, you'll just eventually learn the look of it. But you always got to check, you know, am I right? It was this wrong. What is this? Just ask questions. So, um, so it's, it's, it's change. What causes speciation changes in environment coupled with mutation. So this is the thing that the changes, things always mutate. You know, uh, we see this in the fucking coronavirus. There was a mutation uh, that occurred that made it more contagious. Boom. So that that makes the individual's uh, uh, viral particles with that mutation and makes them more successful. Okay. Uh, when virus, as viruses progress, as they evolve, they tend to get less lethal. Why? Because the ones that kill their host immediately before they have a chance to spread are not going to they're not going to thrive. Those aren't going to make it. If you if you kill your host immediately, this is why SARS one didn't make it uh, that that far. You know, it wasn't. It was cases were symptomatic, and it killed people. It had a higher lethality rate. You know, the adaptive benefits for COVID are that it can lay dormant in pe not dormant but asymptomatic, and it's extremely contagious. If COVID kills more people, that's not an adaptive trait. Your host dies. You're using your host as a viral factory to produce more viral particles. You know that you don't want that. You don't want to burn down your house, right? So it's, again, it's not don't anthropomorphize. It's not benevolence to the virus. It's just the way evolution works. So, um, you know, these mutations arise. Same thing happens on a more macro scale with with plants, mutations will arise. A, a certain, you know, suddenly you get a flowers or a species that mostly produces purple flowers, suddenly it produces uh, white flowers, okay? Say the pollinator, something in the environment changes. The pollinator that pollinates those purple flowers gets knocked out. Now you got a pollinator that pollinates at night. Say it's a bat. A, a pollinator that pollinates at night is not gonna see purple flowers, right? So it's gonna stop pollinating them um, it, to such a large degree. But you got these mutants it's a recessive allele, say, but these mutants produce white flowers, right? White flowers stick out like a like a fucking sore thumb at night when everything's dark. So that's going to cause these things that pollinate bats, for instance, at night or sphinx moths to really home in on those white flowers. And by doing so, they accentuate that allele for white flowers. So a couple generations, maybe a thousand, ten thousand years down the line, that species doesn't produce purple flowers anymore. I mean, that allele's been filtered out. It's mostly producing white flowers. And this is the really cool shit. I mean, when we kind of have decoded how it works, you're mixing Mendelian genetics with Darwin's theory of evolution. And now we have DNA to look at how this stuff happens. We can measure it, which also makes the fact that there's still people that deny evolution fucking insane to believe. I went to like the, the evolution denier museum in Texas. I, I fucking had to go, didn't pay to get in. Uh, I wanted to do a video there, but it was kind of weird because I'd be like blatantly making fun of them and they were right there, you know, but it's just, I mean, we could see how this stuff works. It's like looking at the gears of a clock and seeing how it works. And then you got someone telling you that the clock is false. It doesn't, it's fake. It doesn't exist. So um, anyway, cool shit. Any questions? Uh, I, had, I, had a, I had a question about that. Like, so this is something that I struggle with kind of on a moral sense, I guess, but uh, uh, speaking of like invasives, like, do you think that 
plants that are being impacted by by humans are going to evolve in similar ways in response to the impacts that humans are making or do you think that we're moving so fast fucking shit up that the plants won't be able to to adapt like will some like will the the invasives of today eventually diverge and become natives on a on a geologic time scale yeah that i mean another way to think about invasive species is they're just dispersal events so but dispersal events have never happened at this rate before there have been hundreds of thousands of dispersal events of both plants and animals and fungi and and insects insects or animals uh in the last hundred years that's never happened before i i can't think of a case in which that's happened normally dispersal events will get one they're very rare you know they're very rare much more rare than this they occur but they're much more rare than this and because of how slow they are the ecosystem has time to adapt there may have been dispersal events 5 10 50 million years ago that occurred that that caused extinctions may have happened we'll never know okay i mean it's it's thought that you know when when dingoes arrived to australia to the mainland that's what caused the extinction of the tasmanian tiger which isn't a tiger at all uh, long before people got there you know it's i don't know i maybe it was maybe people did bring dingoes i forget but that maybe the aborigines brought things I, the, either way the idea is is there you know these dispersal events happen but they were somewhat they were rare compared to today so will these things evolve if we go extinct well yeah they will but they'll cause a lot of extinctions i mean this is what this is the idea to get across is there will be species that go extinct even with proper management uh due to invasive species i mean they just they don't have any checks and balances here you know, every, I always say this in my videos to every fucking tree disease we have that's causing decline in a tree species in, in the United States is an invasive species. It's an invasive uh, insect. It's an invasive fungus. It's, it arrived here, doesn't have any checks and balances because it didn't evolve in this ecosystem. It evolved 8,000 miles away. And, you know, over time, uh, things get checked, you know, checks and balances, right? There will be a fa a bacteria that ends up, you know, checking that fungus, or there'll be an animal that ends up checking that insect, or there'll be an insect that evolves, it ends up evolving to check that plant, but it takes a long time. And also, you know, habitats carved up by people now. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, what will happen to the rest of the ecosystem, things are going to go extinct, you know, there's just no way that they can. I mean, when you see monocultures of uh, Saharan mustard in the Mojave Desert, and they're just so successful there. I mean, you get this, you form this kohlrabi-like root, you produce thousands of seeds in a single plant and they spread, they're just really adaptive uh, adaptive uh, traits in this new environment. And so that ends up choking out, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of species of really cool annual little wildflowers. So this is why we need to manage it, right? So it might be an uphill battle, but so is fighting cancer. If someone had cancer, would you tell them, oh, you're never going to get it, it's futile, fuck it. You know, I mean, no, every, most people are going to fight the fucking cancer. You know, you don't do something because you know you're going to win. You do something just because it's the thing to do to preserve something you love. So, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of these idiots, not, no offense, but deny the impact of invasive species. I mean, I've seen it firsthand everywhere I've gone. I see plants that are native here and don't get out of control here, but you go to Australia and they just run rampant and they lead to biodiversity loss. And furthermore, they directly lead to extinctions. Will that plant, if humans went extinct and, and quit bringing new individuals of that species over to keep the gene flow going, will those eventually evolve and get checked by something in that environment? Absolutely. Uh, but the question is what, in the meantime, what's the cost? How many plants will go extinct? And further, how long will that take? So everything will eventually level itself out but don't take solace in that because a lot of there's going to be a fucking cost. There's going to be a lot of things that go extinct because of that. And like I said, these invasive species dispersal events that we're causing uh, are going to cause extinctions. There's no way, there's no way around it. I mean, this is a mass extinction, you know, the, and invasive species are one of the main causes of it, invasive species and habitat loss. So uh, hopefully that answered the question. Anyone got any more? No? All right. Here we go. Okay, there we go. There we go. There's that book. Plant systematics. Uh this is this is the fucking 
one of the most wonderful books for it. And like I said, you, if you buy it, it's a reference book for the next five or 10 years, however long you care about this shit. Um, no, it's like 60 bucks. If you don't have it, fine. You can get on LibGen too. But if you got a chance to throw this guy some money, buy it, do it. Um, this really breaks it down. You know, some of the, the cladograms I showed you at the beginning of this were, were taken from uh, this book. He's got a glossary in the back. He goes into order. He goes into families. It's not just on flowering plants. He goes into conifers and mosses and flowering plant evolution. It's a really elucidating book to shed light on uh, the rest of Earth's biosphere, um, at least the photosynthetic elements of it. And the concepts that you learn in this book when you learn about evolution can apply to mammals and bacteria and what it, birds, whatever. So uh, let's see. Common North American uh, pl flowering plant families, Asteraceae sunflower family, You've probably heard me rant about all these uh, in the videos. We won't spend too much time. This is really important. I'm a naturalist. I told you to download this before we started today. This is where you can really uh, learn this shit. I mean, this is, you learn how to use that explore feature. This is on Android. I guess on, I, on the iPhone, it's a little different. iPhone will just take you to the iNaturalist website, but all this info is still there. You get, you type in, in that field on the left, you know, the taxon that you're looking for, plants, type in plants, you got to wait for their suggestion to come up. You can't just hit search. It'll say, no, you know, we don't, we don't know this. Wait for the suggestion to come up, tap on it. My location, you got to know your county, your state, uh, your continent, and you will get, and you hit search, let it, the suggestion come up, hit search, and you'll get a list of everything that's been observed in your area. Look on this middle photo, you got how many observations, how many species, uh, how many observers do you go to the, on the bottom part of that? You click on the map where that little wavy line is with the two black bars on either side of a white bar. Then you get a map. So you, it's, I mean, it really, it's pretty, it's a pretty fucking incredible tool. Once you learn how to use it, you can teach yourself botany. You can teach yourself plant systematics using iNaturalist alone. And even cooler, uh, when you go to a species page, you click on like, you know, a new little chips, the genus, click on, on the actual species page. It'll take you to the species page. That's what I was talking about before. View children. See, so you you go, you can click on Nick Taginaceae. That'll take you to the, the uh, taxon page for the four o'clock family, which is in the order Caryophyllale, same order as spinach and beets. Um, you can click on that and it'll show you all the genera in the family. If you're looking at a genus page like we are here in this center pick, genus Anulocallus, click on view children. It gives you all the species of Anulocallus. I mean, it's it's like looking through a catalog of the different things that evolution has produced. It's fucking, it's wild. It's really cool. Uh, some of these like Anulocallus and Tony Orem, look at that, that hasn't even been observed yet. There's no fo There's no thumbnail photo there. I mean, it's, that makes me, that, that you know, ex that, uh, that, attracts my attention why the fuck are there no it must be really rare now i want to read about it so now maybe i'll go to google scholar now and look up a new localis and tony orum when was it named how recently described is it? it bet you it probably grows on gypsum in northern mexico because hinton was a mexican botanist a new localis a lot of the species show a disposition towards gypsum so i don't even know about that but i'm willing to bet that's the type of substrate it grows in and of course you know, we'll go through these these plant porn photos later. You'll see some of the examples of gypsum endemics are fucking wild. So that that's the thing to, to learn here. And I mean, like I said, you can click on plantae. You can do the same thing. View all the children in Kingdom Plantae, all the taxon pages of Kingdom Plantae, all the variations on the family of Nictaginaceae. Then you can look at what order is Nictaginaceae in. It's a fucking really cool tool. And you can do this with reptiles, birds, anything. You know, and so it, it'll show you how closely related things are uh and how, how things have evolved how evolution has worked that's really fucking exciting and fascinating so anyway here we go here's here's plant in situ pornography we'll run through some case studies got the you know things to talk about mostly this will focus on soils before we get into it, any questions from anybody is everybody still with me no one's too hungover no one's uh confused or what Still yes, still here. I'm here. All good. Yes, yes. great. Okay, don't no doing bong rips. Wait, wait to do them after so you don't lose your attention span. Okay. I waited. Well, yes, sir. So limestone endemic. So a lot of these rocks uh, produce 
they have both physical uh, stresses and chemical stresses. Stresses. I think limestone. Uh, I haven't looked into this too much, but I've read that it can be deficient in phosphorus. So you know, which of course affects roots. So you'll get uh, uh, synapomorphies that occurred because of that stress. But mostly uh, in these areas, especially out west, where it's just limestone and there's no topsoil, you just get this bare limestone rock. You get plants that will grow out of the cracks in this limestone. So limestone is very porous. It uh, tends to uh, dissolve slowly under rainwater. You know, like I remember as a little kid growing up in the Midwest, you'd go to these old cemeteries. We used to go fuck around and these gravestones were all limestone. Sometimes people died 120 years ago. You couldn't even read the names anymore because it was slowly eroding. And I'll show you pictures of, uh, you could see the dimpling in, uh, in rock that's caused by this, the reaction with uh, slightly acidic rainwater. Due, you know, due to the carbonic acid in there, due to the CO2. And so that's why you get a lot of caves in limestone areas. I mean, shit, when I was at El Cielo Biosphere Reserve in Mexico, the whole area is underlain by these massive fucking caves. You can go in one of them. You know, I did a video on it, just this huge fucking stadium sized cave. Again, the result of limestone very slowly, uh, you know, corroding and weathering with acidic rainwater. So here's a perfect example. Uh, of a limestone endemic species. This is Peridale gracilis. This is at a place called uh, Canyon Diablo, Arizona. And uh, this, this is actually really cool. This is old limestone. It's, you know, I found ammonite fossils there. Ammonites went extinct with that KT extinction, the, the meteor that hit the dinosaurs. So that tells you at least that rock is, you know, older than 66 million years. There were limestone, there were ammonite fossils everywhere. You know, ammonites like Nautilus looks like an octopus with a curly Q shell. Um, so, and you can see, look at the texture of that rock. See the dimpling? That's all because of the way it reacts with, with rainwater. And it doesn't rain here very much. It's the fucking, you know, this is like central Arizona. Uh, but when it does rain, it works, it works away at that limestone and over massive amounts of time, you know, it creates caves. It's created this canyon that I'm standing on the sketchy edge of. And it also, with limestone, it creates these really cool kind of staircase uh, patterns, which you can kind of see in the background there. See how like it's wider, the higher up you go, the wider it is. It's because that rock has been exposed for a longer amount of time. So it's had more time for that rainwater or the, maybe the river in this case to work at it and, and chisel it out. Uh, here's, um, I was confused with Argemony. Our Arctomicon uh, miriamii, the bear poppy it's called because of the leaves apparently look like a bear paw and they're covered in fuzz. This is from the fucking Mojave Desert. This plant grows a lot in Death Valley. Uh, immediately look at the blue color. You got the hairs on it. Boom, it's a fucking desert plant, of course. Not only is it a desert plant, it's growing out of a fucking vertical limestone cliff face that actually looks like it might have a little bit of gypsum in it uh, next to uh, an abandoned mine. This was a fucking really cool plant. I remember the minute I found this, I was like, God damn, this is like picturesque. You know, this is fucking insane. Remember the poppy family that has evolved to grow out of, I mean, there's no soil there. Like how does that, what are the conditions that it takes for that seed to germinate? Does the rock have to be wet? Is there a cryptogamic crust that holds that seed in there? Uh, how old is this plant? This plant could be fucking 20 years old, you know, who knows? Um, and, you know, it's, quite likely that a lot of the limestone has, you know, once it rains, it kind of holds onto that moisture. It's a porous rock where there's cracks in it. Uh, it, it maybe it behaves like a sponge and holds onto that water uh, longer than like rhyolite, which is just silica, you know, and water will just run right off. Limestone, of course, is calcium carbonate. That's why you get that uh, reaction with the, the carbonic acid diluted in rainwater. So there's uh, Arctomicon mariami. I, all species in this genus, and there's only three of them, uh, are endemic to either limestone or gypsum. There's two other species that grow in gypsum. They're equally fucking wild. I think I got a photo of one. But I mean, they grow in areas where it doesn't seem like a plant should be able to grow. You know, gypsum, when it's wet, kind of spongy, kind of soft. When it's dry, it's got the texture of bad concrete. It's brutal to kneel on. Seeds can't penetrate it. Uh, you know, if like a radical or a root emerges from a seed, it cannot penetrate that crust but then it changes texture when it's wet. Gypsum, of course, is what we make drywall from. Look at the leaves on that, man. This blue and so fucking hairy. 
Uh, the blue color, also called being glaucous, uh, helps reduce, uh, it helps reflect uh, ultraviolet radiation. The hairs keep the moisture in, also reflect ultraviolet radiation. The whole point is to keep the leaf temperature down and keep the moisture inside. Moisture transpires from plants in those tiny little pores, often on the undersides of the leaves called stomata. You have to have those stomata open uh, at times when you're photosynthesizing to bring in uh, your building blocks, your CO2. Uh, but that's the, the bummer too, is when you got them open, you're also losing moisture. So how do you cope with that? You evolve hairs, you evolve a thick wax. A lot of desert plants will have just have, they won't have hairs, they'll just have a really thick cuticle, AKA the wax on them too. Another cool limestone endemic. You're only going to find this growing on limestone. Salvia funeria, the funeral sage, also from the Mojave Desert. There's the flowers. I mean, the calyx on these are, look like cotton balls. I mean, it's like the Mojave Desert, of course, is the driest desert in North America. As you proceed east, you get a little bit more summer rain. When, when you end up at the Chihuahua Desert, you, you get a lot more summer rain. It's still a desert, still really hot, still really dry. You still have that those descending high pressure systems at that latitude uh, causing the aridity. Um, but you get a little bit more summer rain. You get the summer monsoon. Not so in the Mojave Desert. It's so fucking dry. I mean, the Mojave Desert has the biggest assemblage of white and, and like sky blue plants I've ever seen. It's fucking incredible and spiky. Look at how these leaf tips have been modified to be, to be spines. I mean, it's fucking, it's so, there's a story there. That's what I'm trying to teach you. There's a story there behind that morphology. It's not just, oh, look at that. It looks kind of cool. I'd like to take a photo of it, put it on my wall or, Oh, I can make a potion, put it in my ass. There's a fucking story there that relates to geology. There's a story there that relates to plate tectonics and how the uh, deserts have evolved to, to what, what, you know, in the Earth's atmosphere is causing there to be a desert at that locale. Um, you know, plate tectonics in some cases, you know, what mountains have arisen and that caused the rain shadow, you know, the, that all that air rises, that moisture laden air rises, when it hits that mountain, it's forced upward, dries out, loses all its moisture, and everything on the east side of that mountain, you know, become their landscape becomes super dry. So new species evolve. This is a fucking great plant, and it smells great too. It's a, I mean, it's a sage, it's a salvia, uh, and look how small the flowers are too. Just big enough to get noticed by pollinators, but not too big that they're going to lose. They're going to be a source of a source of moisture loss. Agave utahensis. There's like three different species of this. I've never paid much attention or cared to, uh, not species, varieties of this. I've never cared to figure out which ones they are. Ebora spina, is it subspecies in evidences or variety in evidences, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just a cool plant, again, another limestone endemic. You only find this growing on limestone. Is it because of the porosity? Is it because of the, the uh, different uh, cation and anion structure of the, the rock it's growing in because of the lack of phosphorus and this is adapted to a lack of phosphorus i don't know you know who knows and you'd have to investigate that study that individual plant to figure out why but you will never see this growing on volcanic rock and i've seen it all over southern nevada and southeastern uh california not once have i ever seen it on a volcanic rock like rhyolite or andesite or especially basalt it's only growing on this really old limestone like in some cases three four hundred five hundred million years uh, that's got the texture of really harsh sandpaper. So I can see a limestone hill from four miles away and tell you what plants I'm probably going to find there, you know, if it's in the Mojave Desert, which I'm familiar with, you know. And this is where you start to see these, these similarities and these traits. And again, they point all point to the same story of how this thing evolved. This another fucking favorite, Death Valley monkey flower, the Plachis rupicola, only find growing on limestone, only find growing in the cracks of limestone. Very rarely, will you, you'll never find it growing on sand. You'll never find it growing in an area where there's like a soil, even if that soil is limestone based, limestone was a parent rock. You'll only find this growing in crevices of fucking limestone rock. And the habitat here, as you can tell, was really fucking cool. I had a great time. This isn't the fucking Janet Jackson uh, at the start of the pandemic crawling around on these limestone rocks, almost breaking my ass and just being fucking stoked. I was like, this is epic, man. This is awesome. There you go. See the hairs on it. You get closer. It's, it's bright green. But when you get closer, not only do you see hairs, but you can see little glands. That's why it's got that kind of shiny nature to those leaves. 
the fucking flowers are beautiful, totally incredible. And the, the, the habit of how this thing grows just out of cracks in limestone rock, only from a few mountain ranges around Death Valley uh, is what makes it so uh, exciting. I think it's a California endemic and maybe it occurs over the border in Nevada in a few limestone uh, ranges too, but uh, Astragalus panum intensus, that netted shadow on is my hat. This was, I was I'd like crouch over it to get a good low contrast photo. Um, this was growing again out of straight rock. You know, Astragalus, AKA the local weeds, it's all, they're all over the fucking globe. They're, that's been a very successful genus in the pea family. You got a typical pea family flower right there, a banner, wings and keel. The banner is that big uh, uh, posterior petal. Right there, <clears throat> astragalus. If you know it, it's this is a really cool variation on it because astragalus only has these big leaves, pinnate leaves, you know, little leaflets opposite each other on the the rachis, the the stalk. Uh, but this one, it's from such a fucking dry environment. Not only are the leaves blue and covered in hairs, but the leaves have been so reduced that the the fucking and it's photosynthesized through the stem that it just looks like it, the leaves, if this, this thing wasn't blooming, it almost looks like a grass. And that's another synapomorphy. Uh, well, not a synapomorphy because it's it's a convergent trait. You know, plants can have this trait without being related, but that's another thing you'll see in a lot of desert plants is stem photosynthesis. Most uh, obvious example is cacti, but you'll look at Palo Verde, the Palo Verde tree in Arizona. I mean, that thing can have leaves, but uh, at some point, there was a mutation where that thing uh, started producing chlorophyll in its stem that proved adaptive and beneficial. Now it could lose its leaves and save all that moisture. You lose your leaves, you're not losing any moisture anymore, but you also can't photosynthesize. But this can, the Palo Verde, not this plant, but Palo Verde uh, in the pea family, it's a leguminous tree, can uh, photosynthesize through its stem tissue, so it's not an issue if it loses its leaves. It's an adaptive trait. This uh, is not limestone, I just wanna show it, it's cool. It looks like snow. This is uh, in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, technically the Mojave Desert still. What is that rock composed of? Who's got a wild guess what that shit is? Gypsum. Nope. Anyway, this is why you get Titanium? that. Titanium? <laughs> What's up? Serpentine. No, no, serpentine is always like blue or red. Yeah. Oh. So maybe it's salt, could be salt, maybe gypsum, maybe. Let's get up close and look at the rock with a hand lens. It's fucking, it's ash, it's volcanic ash. You see that texture, looks like a piece of pumice. This is probably, the whole screen is maybe one millimeter across. Uh, you see the, the, you know, the gas, the gaseous nature of this high silica rock. Remember, pumice and, and obsidian are the same thing just occur they're chemically the same thing they just different environments create them uh this thing was filled with a lot of gas it was very frothy and that's what this was so this was this is volcanic rock <laughs> this is volcanic rock it's it's volcanic ash um i haven't seen how this really affects i haven't seen too many endemics to volcanic ash um obviously the stress is there it creates a barren environment it can be hard to grow and doesn't retain moisture but it's the Mojave Desert. Everything is pretty barren. Um, but again, that's another great thing to use a hand lens. I mean, right there, you look at that and you're like, oh, this fucking pumice. It's like a tiny grain of pumice. No shit. Oh, okay, cool. You can see Jack patiently waiting for a sausage right there. Uh, here we go. Back in the limestone, Epithelantha micromeris. This thing's fucking incredible too. Uh, you got um, Astrolepis, the fern on either side. Teradaceae is the family on that. One of my favorite desert ferns, a Zarek adapted fern. Zarek just means dry. Um, this thing, this is in New Mexico. You could see, this is another cool thing about cacti. Spines are not always defensive. Spines can be for uh, crypsis. Spines can be for camouflage, which is what this guy is doing. This is, you can touch this and it doesn't hurt. There's not, they're not going to poke you, but those spines have been modified in such a way that it basically makes it blend in with the uh, with the limestone. Nice money shot up close. So you can see the green, the, the tubercles there. The, the spines also keep that that uh, epidermal tissue, the temperature of that epidermal tissue down. Could someone turn off that mic, whoever, whatever that's coming from? Sorry, thanks. So those spines, you know, can serve multiple purposes. It's an adaptive trait to have 
spines like this that that aren't pokey don't waste that energy putting out these central spines that are going to poke herbivores if this is enough half the time the herbivores won't even be able to see you you know rabbit won't be able to see you and also you're mitigating that ultraviolet exposure but then when you want to get noticed you want your fruit to get dispersed you make it bright red or not make it of course evolution is not a conscious decision certain alleles get accentuated uh, over others the allele to produce red fruit is the basically the standard now for this species and a lot of cacti do it so a bird will come by see that pick it up fly off with it eat the skin and drop those tiny little uh poppy seed like cactus seeds uh out somewhere new and disperse it another cool limestone endemic petrophyton sespitosum rose family this thing is closely related to rose well not it's more closely related to roses and cherries and strawberries and raspberries and almonds than any other plant, okay? Than plants that aren't in the rose family. This thing is thought to be a basal member, i.e. it evolved relatively early, early on in the history of the rose family. Uh, and this thing only grows on rocks. It only grows on vertical rock walls. Sometimes if the limestone has been tipped or you get a limestone boulder, it'll grow on that too, but it doesn't grow in soil. And these things can last for hundreds of years. Another pretty- What is another a basal member? Basal just means you got to think of a cladogram, right? So, or a, a family tree. So a basal member would be at the base of the family tree, it would be one of the early diverging, early branching lineages. Uh, like Amborella is a basal member, uh, is a basal lineage of angiosperms, of flowering plants. Um, you know, it just means it, it branched off the, those long, lonely branches I was showing you in that cladogram before. Um, common ancestor uh perfect not necessarily but shared yeah it's it's in the rose family so it shares a common ancestor it's more closely related to roses and strawberries than it is to any other plant family but it still stands out stands almost alone in the rose family itself okay but and of course if you were to get down and look at those flowers the hand lens you'd see the rose flower the rose family flower synapomorphies you'd see a few of them uh, that it shares with other rose members of that family. So here's, here's Peridale kinkaflora, Asteraceae, another limestone endemic, uh, another rare and uh, narrow dist distribution only known from a handful of uh, limestone mountains in uh, I believe Northern Texas and Southern New Mexico near Guadalupe National Park. Here we go, gypsum, calcium sulfate. So there's a lot of sulfate dissolved in the oceans. I think for every like liter of, of seawater, you have like 2.5, uh, what is it, milligrams of uh, sulfate. Um, so it's, it's there. And eventually, you know, when you get shallow seas where water evaporates more than in really deep seas, where it evaporates faster, you get these gypsum precipitates. So gypsum uh, is like limestone in the way that it weathers and, uh, uh, reacts with acidic rainwater really easily. It becomes mobile. If you want to think of it like that, it's, you know, it dissolves readily in, in water more so than limestone does. It's, it's become, it's like a mobile uh, uh, mineral, you know, mobile with water. So it'll get weathered with rainwater and then get deposited out somewhere else when that rainwater dries. So it's originally uh, the result of shallow seas, it's a sedimentary rock, the result of shallow oceans, limestones associated with deep oceans. But, uh, you know, in, in areas, you mostly get the gypsum where you're gonna see it is areas where evaporation exceeds uh, precipitation, where it's hotter and drier and that water evaporates more than it, it falls in the form of rain, right? Because if, if you had gypsum in like Florida, it would just weather away and that would be it. Once it was exposed due to plate tectonics or the layer above it getting eroded, the geologic layer above it getting eroded, it would just weather in the, it, it corrode in the rainwater and just it'd be gone, that'd be it. But in areas where it's so dry, you don't get much rainwater, that's where gypsum sticks around a little bit longer. And so this is fucking cool. There's a huge gypsum belt, north to south gypsum belt, sporadically occurring from like Northern New Mexico, just Northwest of Albuquerque, all the way down into Nuevo Leon, through, through Coahuila, the Mexican state of Coahuila, et cetera. And, and over time, what that has done to plants is fucking fascinating. 
It's similar thing as serpentine and sandstone and limestone. You get plants that are gypsum endemic. Some plants uh, will grow off gypsum, and but they'll tolerate gypsum. And then there's a handful, a lot of a lot of species that actually uh, only grow on gypsum. They're endemic to gypsum. The question, of course, is do they grow there because they need the gypsum, or do they just grow there because nothing else can compete? Gyps gypsum soil is so fucked up, and there's no topsoil there, and it forms such a hard crust when it's dry that nothing else can grow there. And so these have a competitive advantage. It's it's mostly the latter. They have a competitive advantage because of their adaptations to it, but there's exceptions. Anyway, moving right along, here's the, uh, everybody's favorite, super rare cactus species only discovered uh, a decade or two ago. This is Aztecium hintonii. Looks a lot like Geo hintonia mexicanum, which it is sympatric with, but you could see here, it's growing on what looks like someone like a fucking cement truck exploded right it just dumped this stuff out there's no soil these things are just growing straight out of the rock it's wild and this is a kind of a rare case they're growing on almost a horizontal substrate right here but uh you know in most cases these things grow out of fucking walls they grow out of rock walls the craziest shit i've ever seen here's the habitat you got pinus arizonica in the background uh in the foreground you got uh a lot of yucca i think it was yucca carnarosana a bunch of other species that are adapted to, to growing on gypsum, but you have almost, uh, you know, like a 70 degree slope of fucking gypsum. It's wild. Um, you know, and it's at the correct latitude for a desert. It's in the rain shadow of the Sierra Madre Oriental. Most of the rain's coming from the east, from the Atlantic Ocean to the east, from the Gulf to the east, etc. cetera. Uh, here's Geo Hintonia Mexicana, other species that grows St. Patrick with it. That is, they grow together in the same area. Uh, and you can see that gypsum just corroding. Again, you see that dimpling, you see that ridging, the way it reacts with rainwater. Looks a lot like that Aztecian, but, and you couldn't tell from the photos too much, but if you get close, you can see each one of those ribs uh, that looks like half a CD, a, half a compact disc coming out from that central area. Each one of those ribs doesn't have... Uh, uh, ridges on it. I mean, if you look at the other Aztecium, it does. And of course, when they bloom, they look radically different. The flowers look radically different. There's more Geohintonia. You could see, uh, what is that? I don't know if that's a Myriopteris or a Pelea, that fern down there. Our Gyrocosma, another cool Xeric fern. The Xeric ferns are all in the family, mostly in the family Pteridaceae with a P, Pteridaceae. Really cool family. Uh, I believe it's all over the world, but especially the North American deserts have some wild fucking members of that. So there it is, growing out of vertical rock wall. This thing gets poached a lot too. There you go. You could see those ridges on the individual ribs of Aztecium, Hintonii, and look, the the fucking rock here. It looks like it looks like a salt lick. Like it's so it it and you know gypsum is a salt. I mean, it, essentially, you know, it's as salts are classified in the, the field of chemistry, you know, it's, and it's super soluble in water. So you can see it looks like it's nested in that rock. Uh, my guess is that that little nest kind of grew around that uh, seedling right there. That seedling's probably 20 fucking years old. That's it, and it's like smaller than a penny. So these things grow really slowly and they live for a long time. So it's more, you know, more testament to the desert's fragility and how easily people can fuck them up. Okay, this is from uh, southern New Mexico. This is that Anulocallus gypsum genus. Family is Nictaginaceae, the four o'clock family. Same family as Bougainvillea, which is almost a horticultural atrocity. You see, you know, you fucking Home Depot plant right there, the Bougainvillea. The hum hummingbirds love it. It's cool. It does provide nectar for them, but whatever. But it's in that family, Nictaginaceae. And Nictaginaceae, of course, has its own synapomorphies. You know, they have petaloid sepals. They don't have true petals. They've only got one series of those floral appendages, that being the sepals. Uh, but don't focus on that. Just look at how, look at what uh, the gypsum substrate has done to the evolution of this plant, which is a gypsum endemic over however many millions of years. It's got these leathery like blue basal leaves, really tiny flowers on these stalks that, you know, have such a small surface area uh, so they don't lose so much water. I mean, you can barely see the stalk you know, once you get 20 or 30 feet away from it, you can barely see it anymore. It's just so thin. Um, they're perennials here. Really cool fucking. I saw this thing and I was like, this is the weirdest shit. And the reason we found this is we were driving uh, north. It just crossed the Texas-New Mexico border. And we saw this area and we're like, what the fuck? That's crazy. 
barren environments always produce some really cool plants. If it's barren because it was naturally barren, not disturbed or bulldozed by people, uh, there's always going to generally be some cool plants there. If it's barren because it's serpentine or barren because it's gypsum or barren because it's sand dunes, whatever. So we went there and we found a ton of cool plants we'd never seen before, like this anulo collis. And look at the soil. Again, you get that Vinny mixed the bad batch of concrete thing going on. It's kneeled down on this shit. It tears your knees up really hard. But when it's wet, it turns kind of spongy and, uh, and comes to life. There's those leaves. Coriaceous is the word for that, leathery. Leathery and waxy. Notice that no hairs. They're glabrous, but they're, they have so much wax and such a blue color to them. You know, they can reflect a lot of that light. Another edit. Now, now, that red on the, uh, on the stems there, would that be exam an example of that pigment you were talking about earlier? Yeah, betalanes. Exactly. Yeah. So betalanes and the rest of flowering plants, uh, the equivalent of the betalane pigment in every plant that's not in Caryophyllales is generally anthocyanins, uh, carotenoid pigments. And they look different. They just have a different look. I don't, I, I know that's kind of a shitty way to put it. It just looks different. But if you really look at the, the color of that red pigment, it's, I don't know how I would describe it. It's often maybe kind of more pink, uh, more, uh, the way it reacts with visible light when you're looking at it, the way the visible light reflects off of it is different than if you look at like a strawberry. Like the pigments in a strawberry, that's anthocyanins, carotenoids, uh, the pigment on, like the red margin, the poinsettia is another good example. Like they, the pigments uh, are notably different from betalane pigments. Okay, so, but remember, like you know, I think like five percent of the order Caryophyllales doesn't produce betalanes. They just they lost it. I don't know if they evolved anthocyanins. I think they evolved anthocyanins on their own secondarily. But you know, these are all just the molecular toolbox that plants have to create these things, and so. Uh, betalane proved adaptive enough, and I'm not exactly sure why it's so adaptive, uh, but it proved adaptive enough that every uh, descendant of the wh whatever lineage, whatever ancestor that pigment evolved in, it proved adaptive enough that every descendant, it stuck around, you know, it, almost every descendant. So, but yeah, you could see the betalane pigments right there. That's again, Caryophyllales, the order of beets and cacti. There's the flowers, tubular, uh, almost red, pollinated by sphinx moths or hummingbirds, something that's got to get in there, right? Because all flowers produce nectar at the base as an attractant, not all. Some orchids don't, other, you know, so other plants don't, they rely on mimicry or some orchids will even produce pheromones to attract pollinators. But generally, 95% of flowers produce nectar. So the nectar is in there, you get a little food reward for whatever pollinates it, probably hummingbirds in this case, or sphinx moths too. They got a long proboscis more money shots to that another this one is from up uh this species is from up near the gypsum areas off of uh northwest of albuquerque maybe it's north of Albu albuquerque i forget it's a popular mountain biking area thankfully not like a dirt bike or atv area so it can't get too fucked up but uh uh, this Tonsendia gypsicola, again, another gypsum endemic, not only from a handful of spots, never seen it growing off of gypsum. Tonsendia is a cool genus too. It's, it's got quite a few species in it, uh, all Western, generally high elevation. I mean, this is, the, the elevation here was like four or 5,000 feet, whatever elevation Albuquerque's at. Um, but uh, again, yeah, just another cool fucking variation on a theme. The flowers, you know, bright white. A lot of other Tonsendias can have like orange or purple or pink flowers. This one uh, has white. It's a weird thing too, you'll notice sometimes too, is like plants that grow on these white substrates, you'll often see more white flowers in plant species than not. So like same thing with limestone. You'll see limestone endemics that have white flowers. It's really bizarre. I'm not sure if that's just a coincidence or if there's an adaptive benefit and... Uh, producing white flowers or whatever. Um, anyway, serpentine, one of my favorites. So serpentine, this is where geology and botany really, and the theory of evolution really come together, you know. Uh, so serpentine uh, is a relatively rare rock on planet Earth. You get it in New Caledonia, you get it in Cuba, you get some, even some in Texas, but it's not enough to really affect the evolution of the local flora. It's a small exposure. And you get some in Pennsylvania, and you get a shit ton in California because relatively recently, and I say that in quotes, like 
20, 30 million years ago, there was a subduction zone off the coast of California. Gypsum or serpentine is associated with subduction zones. You can basically uh, synonymize the two. If you say if there's serpentine there, it, it had to get there by either being subducted or abducted, you know, slapped on by a descending oceanic plate beneath the continental plate. This is another thing to, to read up on if you want to learn geology, because it's how the convection currents in the earth work, and it's how plate tectonics work. Subduction, uh, the opposite of subduction zones are seafloor spreading centers where new rock is being created and pushed out uh, in either direction to the left and the right. Um, so it, that's a thing to read up on. Obviously, I can't get into it too much here. I'll, I'll fuck around and try, but. And I got a yawn in my face. I got yawn. <laughs> What's up? And she got her porch time too. Oh, a little bit porch of porch time. time. So What's up? <laughs> Is that a question or did someone forget to mute their fucking microphone? I've forgotten mute. Sounds like someone forgot to mute. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so serpentine, the things you gotta know, high in magnesium and iron, that's the chemistry right there. And you get a lot of nickel. <clears throat> so uh, you got these harsh chemical situations, uh, magnesium and iron in excess amounts, and especially nickel can be hard for plants to grow in, the heavy metals. Okay, they're also, serpentine soils are deficient in calcium and nitrogen. I mentioned all this shit in the videos. If it's redundant, speak up and let me know. Um, Serpentine areas are often barren and the veg vegetation is sparse. And if the, where there is vegetation, it's often pygmy. It grows, it's dwarfs compared to, if it's a plant that can grow both on and off serpentine, uh, that's tolerant of serpentine, but is abundant off of it, you know, you'll see the versions on serpentine are dwarfed. And I got some really nice examples. I'll show you of serpentine in the deserts of Baja, California. Sir, the elephant tree, one of the, another reason not to use common names, it can refer to two different plants, but the Elephant tree that's in the poison oak and mango family, Pachycormus discolor, will grow if it's old enough and conditions are right, sometimes 20, 30 feet tall uh, in other, you know, like on volcanic rock. But you take it to serpentine, it'll tolerate serpentine, but they barely get taller than two or three feet. So you end up with this like sprawling, really crazy fucking bonsai succulent tree. So uh, anyway, serpentine's around the surface of the earth. That's why you need, it needs to get basically kicked up by a subduction zone. Uh, it's mostly, uh, serpentine is basically metamorphous peridotite. Peridotite is the, one of the main constituents of the mantle. So deep, these are normally deep rocks, okay? Which is why, again, why it's rare and why it's associated with subduction zones. There you go, you got a nice little uh, example of what's going on in the center near where it says Juan de Fuca Ridge. That's a seafloor spreading center. The opposite of that, uh, is the subduction zone. So the magma comes up, new crust is created at seafloor spreading centers, oceanic crust that is, and it goes back in to the depths at a subduction zone. So like convection currents in a pot, they come up at the center, then they spread to the sides and then they go back down along the sides of the pot, et cetera. Convection current, that's what is going on here. Convection currents on a much more grandiose scale, not of water, but of rock that's so fucking hot, it's liquid or plasticky. Uh, in many cases, if it's got a lot of silica, it's, it's plasticky. It doesn't really melt. It's not fluid like basalt would be. Silica means viscosity in terms of igneous rocks. So anyway, there's that. Don't fuck yourself up too much on this, but just grasp the general concept. Uh, there's subduction zones also called cause volcanism too. This is from a paper on serpentine. Uh, you got that, um, you can see where serpentine is created. So, or one of the places it's created, uh, it's that, Peridotite, as it gets buried again, as the subducting plate starts to go down, it gets heated up, i.e. cooked, but there's water present too. So it becomes a little less dense. Uh, it's a more lighter, brittle rock. And then of course, eventually it gets pushed up to the top. So tectonic map, I always tell people this is more important than geopolitical boundaries because this is the fucking, this is the tools you got on, the, on, on plate tectonics, right? The dashed lines with no triangles are the seafloor spreading centers. The, uh, the lines with the triangles are the subduction zones. Uh, you got transform boundaries in between, like the kind of the way a, a baseball is stitched, right? Because it's a, the globe is spherical, you can't get straight lines. They gotta, they're gotta be breaks at some point. So that's why you get these kind of stitching zigzags. You'll notice here on the Western coast of North America, just below 
where it says Gorda Plate, where the triangles are, that's the San Andreas Fault. You'll see a discontinuity between the subduction zone, the triangles near the Cocos Plate, and subduction zone, the triangles near the Gorda Plate. That discontinuity is the San Andreas Fault, and, and it, the, which is a transform fault. And to have a transform fault that big on Earth is pretty rare. Okay, and it's caused, a, but it also causes some really cool things geologically in California. You get rocks that have been transported by that fault, you know, 200 miles from where they originated. Some wild shit. Anyway, uh, don't fuck yourself up on that. Well, let's just look at what serpentine does to plants. So here's what serpentine does to a milkweed, right? So because serpentine is so toxic to most plants, it causes these barren environments and, and these desert-like environments and what are otherwise areas that get enough rainfall to not be deserts, but they're still barren again because that soil chemistry is so fucked up. There's not much calcium, not much nitrogen, and there's a lot of heavy toxic metals in there. So this is how uh, the genus Asclepius, the milkweed responds to it. One of the ways, uh, this is Asclepius solanoana. It's a super rare uh, Northern California endemic and you'll only find it growing on serpentine and it doesn't get tall. It just lays prostrate on the ground. The adaptive benefit of that, there's you could come up with your own theories. You could imagine whatever benefit there might be in that. That's part of the fun and learning about this shit. But this is, uh, there you go. And then those flowers again are just so fucking bright. So like spectacular. So you got, you know, pink petals. The sepals are already reflexed. Can't quite see them. And then again, this is just the variations on a theme uh, that geology can can you know throw into the mix with plant species so really really unlike other milkweeds here you don't have any horns the hoods those white things those teeth looking things are not hollow the the corona itself the the, the what you call the maybe gynostegium is is so much it's almost at a different level than the the hoods normally the hoods surround that gynostegium it's just a fucking weird plant man Another plant you only see on serpentine, Pacra greenii. Uh, things you'll notice about serpentine plants is they often have these like psych ward green colored leaves. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if it helps them blend in with uh, serpentine, the serpentine, the blue serpentinite minerals or what? Blue and green serpentinite minerals. Serpentine is blue when it's first exposed. It weathers to red later on as the rock is oxidized. Remember, it's got a lot of iron in it. So here's Pacara greenii, diminutive little fucker. This one's only like four feet, four inches tall. They can be upwards of, uh, I've never seen them taller than eight or 10 inches, but either way, but that bright orange flower, one of the only composites, one of the only members of Asteraceae that have a bright orange flower, at least in North America. And again, you'll never see this growing on, on regular soil. I've only ever seen it on serpentine. It's supposed to be a pain in the ass to grow too. I know a guy at the botanic garden is trying to grow it. Dudley cymosa, this is not a serpentine endemic. It just tolerates serpentine. Uh, who knows if it, it'll eventually evolve into a serpentine endemic species, whatever. But uh, because it's intermediate, because it's tolerant, you can see we're kind of afforded a glimpse of you know, the intermediate evolution. Maybe, who knows? Uh, the thing I, the reason I put this here is, I mean, this, these things blend in so well with the rock. Um, this population does. Dudley mostly is a common Dudley. You'll find it, like I said, growing off serpentine, but here it was growing on serpentine. And uh, this population, if you were to compare it with the population growing off of serpentine, it's not enough, it's not different enough to be a new species, maybe not even a new variety, but I'm, I almost guarantee you, if you compared those DNA barcodes, you would see slight differences in this, maybe in the alleles that code for leaf color or leaf texture, whatever, because it's, Obviously, it's, it gains an adaptive benefit. There's a benefit in, in having a leaf color that's like grayish blue because you'll blend in here. I mean, look, you can't even see these fucking things, right, until you get closer. The only reason you can see them now is because they're blooming, they're conspicuous, they want to be pollinated by hummingbirds. This is, an, this is a, a serpentine endemic, another really cool Northern California species in the genus Clarkia, a member of the evening primrose family. Uh, this was, this is serp, I mean, you can see there's blue and red rock in there. So it's just weathering. Uh, this thing is one of the only Clarkia species. Clarkia is a really cool genus, really showy. Uh, I believe they're all annuals, um, but this one has the fucking hugest petals. I mean, and this shows, this is another good example to show you how 
uh, one of the synapomorphies that's not 100%, but most many members of this family have it, of the Onagraceae, is they got this cobwebby like pollen. So see that these pollen threads, their, their technical term for them is uh, vicin threads, which just means like cobwebby pollen. So the pollen granules stick together in this cobweb uh, like physiology. And that, of course, obviously has proved the benefit to uh, these plants in terms of what pollinates them. So uh, in this case, these are pollinated by sphinx moths. Uh, that's probably why they smell too. Um, they're pollinated by sphinx moths and they've got these enormous, look at the fucking anthers or the, uh, the filaments, they get all swollen at the end, really bizarre. And again, only known from the central coast ranges on serpentine. And here again, you got that barren environment and what shouldn't be a barren environment because it gets, I mean, like 30, you know, 30 inches of rain a year here, a little bit less the last few years because the climate's so fucked up. But, uh, but the rock is just so, so fucking nutrient poor and shitty and stressful for plants to grow in that it's entirely barren here. So this like over here, look in the distance where it's barren, like in between those two uh, shrub lines, right? That looks like just a barren environment. When I got up close, I found like three different fucking rare uh, serpentine endemic plants growing there. So it's always, it always, you know, works to really check out these barren environments a little bit closer, scope them out, see what's growing. There's gonna be small stuff there, but, and you can see a little bit of the green here. There was another cool member of the lily family growing at this exact spot this guy, Fritillaria falcata. Um, this thing only grows in serpentine and more so it doesn't only grow in serpentine soil chemistry, it only grows on talus slopes. You'll never find it growing on flat ground. It only, it only grows, well, because of the way serpentine and ultramorphic rock, which are somewhat synonymous, the way it weathers, it breaks up into these little like inch to two inch size square chunks, geometric chunks. And so because of that, it forms these, the way the rock breaks up and fractures when it's weathered and eroded, it forms these talus piles. So here's this, this is a phenomenon that's been going on long enough on the surface of earth in this area, in this region, that you've had a plant species that have, has evolved to this specific trait, which is serpentine talus. So deep, and these are geophytes, they're lilies, right? So you got a bulb down there. So they're, they come back every year and there's a bulb eight, 10 inches below that talus. It's, it's incredibly fragile when you're walking on these two. I mean, it's like, fuck, I almost hate myself because I'm like, ah, fuck, every step I take, this shit crumbles. You know, not only am I going to break my ass, I'm going to destroy something beautiful too, fuck. But it's fine, you know, that, that bulb will, will come out. The bulb is still down there. You might fuck up a generation, which is not ideal either. But so anyway, of course, it's a lily, it's a monocot. Flower parts are in multiples of three. You can see that three branches to that style. You get up, the stamens are already mostly gone here, but there's, if you were to look closely, you'd see six stamens. So flower parts in multiples of three, six tepals. So another favorite, there you go, boom. And the, these things are so inconspicuous too, they can be. Those blue, again, you got that blue texture, that glaucous texture to those uh, basal leaves. There's my friend, Alan Rockefeller, taking pictures of one. You got that ghost pine in the background too, Pinus sabiniana, not a serpentine endemic, but it's found on serpentine a lot. Here's a serpentine endemic cypress, Hesperocypris uh, sargentii, sargent cypress, one of, one of two or three cypress species that are highly restricted in their distribution. So they're only known from small areas and they're, they only grow on serpentine, only in serpentine. Okay, genus Streptanthus, we'll get into this really quick because the point of this is to show you that this is a, a genus in which it's in the mustard family, so you got the glucosinates, but this is a genus in which serpentine tolerance has evolved like five or six times. So serpentine tolerance has convergently evolved in this genus five or six times. They're, they are closely related, but if you take it to the next level down of taxonomy, they didn't, everything, every Streptanthus that's serpentine tolerant didn't necessarily gain that serpentine tolerance from the same common ancestor. So these are called the jewel flowers. They're, you know, for a fucking mustard, which you normally associate, I normally associate as being a boring plant. It's a weed, you know, you, yeah, I get it. Green, green leaves, yellow flowers, whatever. Uh, this, this thing evolved, it's got purple, look at the leaves, the purple leaves, blue in some cases. So you've got a little bit of crypsis there, a little bit of camouflage and the, the, but the flowers are just fucking incredible. 
but we got the pedals in multiples of four or multiple right, yeah four pedals uh four sepals etc um i think it's six stamens so it's a little bit different but either way uh there you go there's the leaves when these things are just coming up and even cooler if you look at the ridges the margins of those leaves you see those little orange dots the adaptive benefit of those is that they mimic butterfly eggs so that discourages butterflies from laying eggs on there because they're like, oh, this spot's already taken. I'll move right along. Um, yeah, it's fucking wild. I mean, these things, you could be standing right on top of them and you wouldn't notice them if they weren't blooming. This is Streptanthus vernalis. This species was only recently named in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, vernalis, because it's one of the earliest blooming Streptanthus, it blooms in the spring. Again, growing on serpentine, you can see that harsh blue Serpentine talus right there. And this is in uh, Napa County. There's there's the environment. I mean, it just like, whew, like a, a desert where there shouldn't be one. A Streptanthus asparagus, another serpentine endemic. You know, it's just variations on a theme. Look at the ridges in those sepals. <clears throat> this is Streptanthus morrisonii. I mean, again, really dry exposed environment it's northern california but we're inland a little bit uh so it gets really fucking hot here you don't want a lot of surface temperature exposed you got thin stalks thin leaves and then there's your your flowers but you get like three or four feet tall another rare endemic you know who knows when it speciated who knows when this species evolved you know five hundred thousand years ago three million years ago but either way it's restricted to this small area just a barren serpentine Fucking love this habitat, man. And they, these look like blocks of almost raw peridotite, maybe slightly metamorphous peridotite in the background. But again, red or blue. Here's desert serpentine. Oops, I fucked, <laughs> fucked up the uh, that covered the text a little bit. Anyway, this is where it occurs. So I, I first, you know, was thinking about. It, I was like, well, everything. A lot of areas in the the west coast of North America have serpentine because that's where the subduction zone was. I wonder if any ever occurred in Baja. So I wrote a friend of mine who was a botanist down there. I was like, "You ever get Baja? You ever get serpentine in the on the peninsula, the Baja Peninsula?" He said, "Yeah, actually. Also, I just found a new species down there. Haven't described it yet, which I'll show you the pictures of. So there's serpentine here. There's gabbro here, which is not metamorphous. It's it's a another um, igneous." intrusive igneous rock with like but it's like a black igneous rock with like giant black crystals and it. it's fucking beautiful rock it's the uh, intrusive equivalent of basalt so same chemistry but different conditions cooled much slow much more slowly uh, and this is what it looks like so it's it's this is what the not what gabbro looks like but what serpentine looks like in the deserts of baja so you take the climatic uh, stresses of really low rainfall high aridity uh, but you also get fog here too, which helps a little bit, helps the plant life. And you mix it with the chemical stresses of serpentine, you're going to get some wild shit evolving, and in indeed you do. There's some of the rock. This almost looks like chrysotile asbestos. Uh, again, th this, these types of rocks only occurred in certain areas. Th these weren't uniform throughout the, the whole landscape, but where you did find them. I mean, this thing I took home too. I wrapped it in a bag so it wouldn't break off. Because you get asbestos sometimes in serpentine too. Serpentine is a really general term. It's a broad term for a bunch of different minerals. They're all composed of the same, uh, same, the same chemistry, and from a similar uh, uh, origin environment. You know, metamorphous. Um, so they're not all uniform. You get a bunch of different versions of serpentine, um, but with the same, you know, chemical similarities of high magnesium, high iron, high nickel. Like 60% of the world's nickel comes from serpentine uh, exposures from serpentine areas. Anyway, uh, sometimes you'll see areas where there's asbestos in it. There's a spot on the beach near Big Sur where it's like, it's all, <laughs> it's all fucking asbestos. It's these like, it looks like these blue sandy slopes of what is technically all chrysotile asbestos. It's not as dangerous as, you know, the asbestos that they used to manufacture. It's a little bit more raw. It doesn't, it's not airborne as easily, but technically it's asbestos. It's chrysotile. Um, it's fucking crazy. It's really cool too. But just, you know, you expose to it once, you're not going to fuck yourself up. But if you spend a lifetime working in a factory that manufactures asbestos roofing shingles, you might get mesothelioma 
and you might get you know in on one of those lawsuits they advertise on late night tv but anyway there's the chemical structure of the rock i bagged that fucker up took it home and uh there you go there's that nice fibrous nature of some of the more chrysotile uh serpentine so you see you got that dark green to light blue color and it's just i mean it just looks like fibers there it's crazy i don't know if i took this home that might that's a little bit more a little bit more too close to uh asbestos but uh anyway moving on to the flora this is a serpentine endemic this is uh, a type of sumac this is rus lentii so it's in the sumac poison oak and mango family uh the pistachio family anacardiaceae but it's you'll only find it growing on the serpentine of cedros island and the immediate uh baja peninsula coast where there's serpentine and this thing was fucking covered in bees, man. There were hundreds of bees around this thing when it was flowering. There's a nice up close money shot. So you don't have hairs, but you got a really waxy blue leaf with these bright pink intoxicating uh, flowers on it. And you can see in the background, notice how the tops of uh, the those cliffs over there are red and the sides are blue. Why do you think that is? Anybody? Oxidation. What? Oxidation. Yeah, oxidation, right? Because the surface has been exposed technically longer than those slopes have. So, you know, the, the slopes are constantly eroding. There's, it's an unstable rock. It's brittle. It's not that strong. It's constantly new material over eons, uh, you know, falling off and falling into that wash down below, whereas the tops stay relatively uh stable so they've been exposed longer it's been exposed to the atmosphere longer and that's why it's it's more red this is the elephant tree so this is fucking cool these were everywhere two feet tall this thing tops out at and you could see that huge caudiciform trunk caudiciform is just a word for like be, you know like a baobab or like a uh you know whatever you get the idea just like a big swollen trunk a big swollen stem and there it is growing on just volcanics. So that same species right here is getting 30 feet tall and forming this you know, big tree. And then here, it's just this tiny little, they might even be the same age, but here it's just this little tiny fucking bonsai. This is another spot. This is elsewhere on the Baja Peninsula growing on uh, volcanics on, um, looks like uh, pumice, just pumice and maybe a little bit of a salt. I don't know, I didn't forget what it was. So anyway, here's that serpentine again. I mean, the flora here is just fucking so cool. You got a little cactus uh, down there. It's a species of a cyrus. I forget which one. There's the wash. Tons of cool shit coming up here. Lots of endemics that only grow from this tiny fucking area. And th this one, this is Sibara angolorum. See the four petals? That tells you it's either going to be in probably Onagraceae or Brassicaceae. This is in Brassicaceae, the mustard family. Uh, got purplish, bluish leaves. Uh, reflect that UV light, blend in with that substrate more. And then when it goes off, it's just boom, incredible. Another endemic. This is an endemic buckwheat to, to ultramafic serpentine rocks in Baja. This is uh, Ariagonum. Oh, fuck. I can't remember this. I can't remember the species name. Uh, oh, fuck. I have to look it up. There's like three different areogonums from this area uh, that uh, are endemic to serpentine. You get another one, areogonum and celioides. I couldn't find any. I think I put some photos online. If you look up like areogonum and, cel and celioides online, like my photos are like one of the like, only few that come up. I tried to create a Wikipedia page for it because it's such a cool plant, but someone, one of the checkers there was like, you didn't cite your sources or your, I couldn't find the paper that described that areogonum. So I, you know, whatever, they took it down, but the photo should still be up. And it's called Enceliorides because it looks like uh, an Encelia. Yeah, this was areogonum preclarum, another serpentine endemic. This thing's a long lived perennial. You can see it just keeps growing. The old leaves die. That's what forms a candelabra shape and it just keeps growing. When you get up close, I don't know if you can tell them that photo, super glandular, super sticky. Tons of tiny little hairs, each beaked with a gland, just like cannabis. Same thing going on here. Lots of tiny little hairs beaked with a gland. This is Baja Kelia moranii. 
probably one of my favorite members of the composite family in uh, the deserts of Baja, California. It's a serpentine endemic. The leaves have been modified through the filter of evolution to be spinose. They're a little spiny. Uh, the thing is also in the marigold tribe, so it stinks uh, like turpentine. It's got those pungent volatiles. This thing smelled like lemon and turpentine. It smelled like some fucking lemon herbal tea mixed with paint thinner. It was the most bizarre shit. I, I got some seed. I germinated one of them, but it just wasn't hot enough in my greenhouse and I couldn't give it the right conditions, you know, in coastal Calif Northern California. So didn't make it. I still got seed of it, but uh, you know, I haven't tried germinating yet. Another thing about desert seeds that's cool is a lot of these seeds are long lived, right? Because anything that wouldn't, any seed that wouldn't last that long in an area where rainfall might only occur or substantial rainfall might only occur every few years, any seed that wouldn't last that long that's only got a short shelf life would perish. So that would be filtered out by through evolution. So it's an adaptive trait to have long lived seeds. In some cases, you know, 50, 60 years, that's why you get these super blooms. You know, when you get all the fucking uh, Instagram influencers going out to take selfies in like a field of California poppies or, or, or Death Valley super blooms, you know, those seeds are there the whole fucking time. They could be there for four decades and it takes, you know, they've got inhibitors in them, often chemical or physical inhibitors. Chemical inhibitors would be like, uh, you know, chemicals that pre prevent the seed from germinating until they've all been dissolved or washed away by water, diluted by water, by enough rain. Uh, physical, chem physical inhibitors of seeds might be just a really hard seed coat. The genus Erythrina, the coral beans, has a really hard seed coat. They look like the, the seeds are like these bright red beans with like the texture of plastic. To get them to germinate, you got to clip the top with a nail clipper to scarify it in essence to get the water to get in there. So that's an adaptive trait you'll see in a lot of these seeds. Not all seeds will germinate at the same time. Some will lay dormant, some will germinate with the first rain, first big heavy rain, some will take a little bit longer. And again, that's just, you get that genetic recombination. Every seed is a different, uh, a different combination of genes and alleles, et cetera. And so some will germinate right away, some won't. Really cool trait to think about with plants. So the seed, the plant is technically there the whole time, just waiting to germinate. So anyway, there you go. Bah, Kelia morania, another endemic. This is that new species in the milkweed family. It's a species in the genus Modalia uh, that hasn't even been described yet. John Redman uh, at UC, or at the San Diego Natural History Museum just discovered this like five years ago. And uh, we went there looking for it. The first day we couldn't find it because I thought it'd be in the wash, right? Because it's where all the plant life is going to be. That's where the most moisture is. It wasn't growing in the wash. It was growing on the ridges up here, just totally diminutive. And, you know, a fucking species that's never been, quite likely never been seen by people before. Maybe it was noticed by Native American people, but there wasn't a use for it. Uh, and totally new to science, you know, just hiding in the deserts of Baja. Look at how hairy it is, those tiny hairs tiny little flower, tiny little milkweed-like flower. Pentamerous flower, numbers of, multiples of five, numbers of number five, five Maris. Little heart-shaped leaves. I don't even know if he wrote the paper on it. He actually, he asked me not to show these four years ago, or he asked me not to make a post about it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I won't. He's like, because I still want to describe it, but whatever, he's had enough time. If he hasn't done it by now, fuck it, I'll show it to you. So, and that's the habitat. Look, you got fucking agaves back there. That's not a telephone pole in the background. That's an agave stock. <laughs> Such cool habitat. This is Vigiera lanata. So fucking wooly. So wooly and so blue and just adapted to that. You can see that the serpentines eased up. The chemistry's eased up a little bit here. The elephant trees are getting, they grow a little bit taller. So that's probably a younger elephant tree in the background of the one I just showed you. But the soil is not as fucked up, so it can get bigger. The fuck was that? Oh, okay, refugia. This doesn't really have much to do with soils, but you know, refugia. Just the idea that as climates change through time, uh, the geography can act as like a, a safe house uh, for certain taxa and species, and even entire plant communities. So, you know, what I'm going to show you here. Oh, I didn't make this page yet. Oops. <laughs> anyway, these would have been great examples had I not been too much of a lazy schmuck uh, and forgotten to put the photos in here. But these are examples. There's a rare Arizona cypress stand in New Mexico uh, and the Chizos Mountains. Both don't have, there's no other Arizona cypress around either of these populations for like 300 miles. 
um, Alaska cypress. There's a disjunct population of Alaska cypress, also known as Alaska cedar, another nice misnomer common name in Eastern Oregon, which is like 400 miles from the nearest population. And that's because the ge geography, though, if you look at like a terrain map, you can see how the geology, the slope and the little, the way the mountain is carved out, it provided this little refugia for this plant to kind of hide out while the climate changed, it dried out around it. Like or, or Eastern Oregon is like high desert, man. It's like high desert with volcanic substrate. Uh, and, but here in this population, Alaska Cypress, which is a really moisture demanding, shade demanding, uh, needs an intact forest to grow in. There's a little population there still. It, it actually just suffered a fire. It's kind of fucked, it might go out in our lifetimes, but it's still cool to see like, oh, this is a remnant of the fucking Pleistocene, you know? of when uh, the Eastern Oregon was a little bit cooler and a little bit more uh, wetter, got a little bit more rain. Okay, here's the first example of refugia. This is a cool little canyon in Southern New Mexico, kind of near where that uh, Anulocallus gypsogenus was. This is the dug fir growing in this little limestone canyon. Up top, on the top up here on the mesa, it's all juniper stepion. It's all alligator juniper, relatively drought tolerant, low diversity up on top. But in this little canyon, we found all kinds of wild shit that would not, could not survive up top. It needed, the canyon provides shade because of the slopes on either side. And it also acts as a, like that pavement effect uh, for the desert brittle bushes, you know, funnels all the water into it. So we found maples there. We found uh, our uh, madrone there. We found cool members of the hydrangeaceae there. We found monument plant there. The, member of the gentian family, gentianaceae, and Frasera, that really cool fucking Frasera. Anyone who's from the Rocky Mountains knows monument plant. Anyone who's from the Rocky Mountain area and pays attention to botany and likes plants would know the monument plant. Okay, and this is a big disjunct to find it growing in Southern New Mexico in the fucking, what's technically the Chihuahua Desert. So here's a good example. You can see down in this, this is where, this is further up the canyon from what the photo I just showed you. So this little arroyo, eventually opens up into that big canyon. So these are like the headwaters. They were totally dry, but when it rains, they funnel water. These are the headwaters of that canyon. And you can always already see you got Rocky Mountain dug fir, a lot more greenery. Whereas if you look up top, you can see that junipers. There's like juniper and maybe pinyon pine. This was a cool plant, a parasite, member of the Indian paintbrush family, Orobankaceae, which is entirely parasitic, save for two genera in Asia. But uh, Conophilus americana, it's no leaves, no chlorophyll, uh, just pure flowers. It was already done flowering, unfortunately. Looks like it's start. It's about to start here again. You can see those yellow buds. I was trying. To, I figured it was dead, so I pulled it up, but it actually fucked up the plant. I <laughs> I put it back, but it's you know of course got to be attached to its host, so it probably died. My bad, but I got a good photo out of it. And there's plenty more there. Canopolis americana growing in the Chihuahua Desert, which is, I mean, if you know this plant, you know the habitat it's found in, it's unreal. It's very strange to see it uh, in, on the map of what is technically the Chihuahua Desert. But again, it's growing in this refugia, this tiny canyon. You know, and one thing I'll say about refugia too, that's cool is, I mean, I can look at a topographic map at like Google terrain layer and, and see how the topography uh, is laid out and see, you know, what is going to, where going to, what, what areas might have cool plants? I call it masturbating. Like, oh, look at this little nook that's carved out. It's a north facing cirque, a north facing glacial, glacial cirque. So, like a three sided bowl, which means it collects all the water and it's shaded to the south, at least in the northern hemisphere, it's shaded to the where most of the sun comes from to the south. So, there's probably going to be some relictual shit in there. You're going to find stuff in that little glacial cirque or in that ravine that you're not going to find in the rest of the open exposed habitat up on the mesa or in the more you know south facing uh <clears throat> air you know alluvial fans or whatever so it's always good the maps debate become become familiar with the uh, google terrain layer sand endemics another example asclepius prostrata super rare milkweed that only grows in sand from the rio grande valley of uh, south texas this plant's kind of fucked it's, you know state of Texas is not, they've got no plan in place to protect this thing or preserve it. Luckily, there's some people growing it. I mean, in Texas, the most of the botany conservation work falls on the hands of private individuals. The state just doesn't care, you know, whereas like California, 
is you know devotes a lot of money to it and there's all these fucking intense laws about you know you got to do environmental impact reports etc but uh anyway there's a couple private individuals i know who are growing this plant uh san antonio botanic gardens growing it again the seed was sourced by a friend of mine who's one of those private individuals but this thing it only grows in pure sand again you got that prostrate habit just like the asclepius solanoana from the serpentine of not not spending much time forming uh uh you know a stem an aerial stem because it's maybe it would just maybe it's because it would just get gnawed down by herbivores maybe because it's more adaptive for it to just be laid out sprawled on the ground conserve energy but either way yeah this thing's fucking rare. i've still never seen it in bloom i i this thing bloomed two weeks later and i had to leave town so uh <clears throat> another sand endemic right here helianthus argophilus i just put out a video on this this fucking thing is incredible. These are annuals, so they only grow for one season, then they die. They grow really fast. They're covered in fucking wool because, again, they're on that fast draining sand. So sand, the stresses of sand are that it, it drains really fast, doesn't hold on the moisture that well. Surface dries out, gets really hot. There's no topsoil there. Uh, it's, in a, in, it's in essence just growing in pure silica. There's no very little organic material in most cases. And so as a result of that, because ve most vegetation can't grow, you're, there's no shade. You're going to be fully exposed. There's no trees to grow under. <clears throat> so you've got to cope. And one of the ways this sunflower species coped is by forming this intense indumentum of fucking wool. It looks like a cotton ball. I mean, it's incredible. Um, so, you know, this and this thing can grow. It doesn't need to grow on sand. You can propagate this in regular soil. I've done it. But in habitat, it it only grows on sand, maybe again, because it, maybe it would be outcompeted on non-sand substrates. So Helianthus argophilus, silver-leaved sunflower. And it also leaks a lot of resin for any boring insects. So it, you know, would plug them right up. This is this photo was taken 20 miles, 30 miles south of Chicago. It's a cactus that's native to the Chicago region but again, is only found on sand. And the reason the sand is there is because a glacial dam broke 15,000 years ago. Uh, a glacial, the dam to a glacial lake broke. So you had this mass, uh, almost instantaneous flow of water. And when it finally uh, settled down, when the current finally settled down and all the energy from this flow was, was gone and the most of the water was gone, it deposited the sand right here, just south of the city of Chicago. And so uh, this cactus, Opuntia humifusa, thrives on it because nothing else, not a lot of plants can grow on this fucked up sand. It doesn't hold water that much. It's, it's very nutrient poor, again, like we said, but that's not a problem for a cactus, which is in effect like a little battery. Cacti store carbohydrates and water. Uh, you know, you could throw, there's, there have been research papers on this. There have been species of fucking barrel cactus that have been thrown in a closet for four fucking years, no light, no water. And when they're taken out of the closet, uh, they're put back in a medium and watered and given sunlight and they start growing again. I mean, these things can last immensely long times uh, with, uh, you know, none of the things they need to grow. So then if you want to do a, a question and answer now, we're running into three hours and hopefully I still got your attention. I don't know how, but <laughs> maybe I do. If you want to do questions and answers, just uh, let me know. Do you know what's up with the um, cypress that's in Butano? If it's still, if anything has germinated or anything, I'm kind of close to there, but I haven't if, really got up. If they're germinating, they would be doing it in the next few months. I'll take this down. That'll end the presentation. Um, it's fucking over anyway. That was pretty good. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, with the Butano cypress, I. I mean, I saw tons of seed when we were there. It was just, they were all over. I mean, you could squat down anywhere on that small football field, sand size, sandstone uh, escarpment, and you'd squat down and you'd find the fucking, the cypress seed, you know? I mean, they were everywhere. So they're just waiting for, uh, waiting for enough moisture. And I guess they got enough. I, I dipped out of California last month, but um, I'm not going to be back till April, but, but uh yeah, it's been raining like on and off the past few weeks. Yeah, they'll be germinating, man. I mean, that would be a cool thing. To, there's going to be a bunch of cool shit in that area coming back because there's flannel bush in that area. I remember seeing flannel bush there 10 years ago. 
you know, not blooming, but just the leaves and being like, oh, no shit, there's formonodendron. And it's, I've talked to other biologists and botanists there and it's rare, like formonodendron is relatively rare for the Santa Cruz mountains. But that seed again is still there. It's in the soil buried beneath a bunch of duff. And, uh, you know, if you're trying to germinate flannel bush seeds, cypress seeds aren't like this. They just got to open the comb. But if you're trying to, to germinate flannel bush seeds, you got to scarify them with hot water. Same thing you got to do with a lot of members of the cotton family. Uh, you know, give them a hot water treatment, heat up water just to blow boiling, throw it in a pint glass with the seeds, let it soak for a day and boom. So those, those, there'll be a bunch of good shit coming back probably. I mean, it's going to be cool to see doing inventory there in the early summer. Yeah, because I've seen like flannel bush down in Monterey, but I don't think I've ever seen it in the Santa Cruz Mountains. That's really awesome. Yeah, yeah, that'll be sad. Do you really have the ocean behind you or is that like- No, it's just a background. Oh, well, <laughs> My pick. house is gross, so I have a pretty background. Yeah. Are you germinating of... any of the seeds that you showed us today in your presentation? Like right now? Uh, Which ones? Any of them? Or- I'm interested in did you take any of the those lilies or tulip bulbs from the serpentine area? No, I didn't. I mean, you know, I because I felt fucked up doing it, but I probably should have because the, the that was trespassing on private land. I should have taken them and given them to a botanic garden. Um, because the dude who owns that land's a fucking dick. He's like probably one of the people that was storming the fucking capital two days ago. I mean, he's he's a uh, and, you know, he's, that area is like, you know, California is all liberal progressive, but like that area is super like fucking Oklahoma almost like super paranoid, super mine, my property, my property. And uh, I should have dug up a couple bulbs, you know, because people do that actually a lot in Texas. Like a lot of the, the people, and that was something I kind of struck me when I first got here. I was like, it's fucked up. You can't, you're poaching. Uh, but in a place like Texas, where there's so much private property and a lot, I mean, these guys were taking it not to sell. Uh, they took it to, to preserve. I mean, that's what we did in the fucking moving the cacti for the wall, right? I mean, then we were fucking poaching. You know, we're conserving those to we'll give them to institutions that can take them or whatever. The plants are just going to be bulldozed anyway, but technically that's poaching. And a lot of poachers will say, oh, I'm, I'm preserving it. I'm saving the plant. It's just, it's a, it's bullshit. They're not, but either way, I should have probably done that with that fertile area of Falcata because, uh, I mean, they're, they're fine, but that area was getting trampled by cattle when we were there. And that was something, I mean, a, a cow could fuck up that whole, a person steps on that habitat, those steep talus slopes, and that shit just crumbles. I mean, whoa, it just all falls down. I mean, think of what a fucking thousand pound cow could do, just destroy it. And that guy doesn't give a fuck, the owner, he doesn't give a shit. He's flowers, fuck that, you know, I don't care about flowers. So, uh, yeah, no, I should have taken some, but I didn't. Um, but the important thing is, you know, as we see, because the tumor is not stopping, I say this shit all the time, the tumor is not stopping anytime soon, you know, plant conservation, uh, horticulture has a huge part in that, even if it's just horticulture in botanic gardens. That's not an excuse to poach, but it's, it's a thing to think about for those reference libraries of living plant material, material that are botanic gardens, you know, so that's, that's the thing. Like, I don't want the responsibility of growing shit. I don't want to collect it. I'll germinate it, but then I'll fucking give it away. Cause I don't, I'm not home enough. I don't want to have to worry about it. If I kill it, you know, it's, I feel like shit. So like I got an Amborella germinating now in back in California, when that thing's big enough, I'm giving it to UC Berkeley. I don't fucking want it. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Keep it in my, my little, my personal collection. It's mine. You know, it's not, I want people to be able to enjoy it and learn from it. That's a really important plant. To have people can take cuttings from it and you know propagate it so but no i didn't i mean the stuff i'm germinating now like i got a bunch of texas stuff that i'm just i just sewed in the, the ground outside because i was like i don't want to fucking deal with it you know I, um, I got a little grow dome uh i actually just bought like a storage thing at walmart it's like kind of lifted one of them uh self-checkouts your friend at walmart and uh and got some led lights and you know the purpose of that is to keep the humidity up you poke some holes in it so you get a little bit of aeration you can grow the shit on your own fill the bottom with soil because the soil kind of helps keep the moisture in too but um it was way more info than you asked about so <laughs> sorry unsolicited rant but uh, ah, that's okay it's okay it's what we're here for we pay 10 bucks for this it's fine um thanks anyway <clears throat> yeah next next question 
I have a question about the Simpson book. Um, as an academic, I know that newer editions of books aren't always better. Um, do you recommend the 2005 edition or the 2010? I've just been poking around online to get uh, a You just got this one, the 2018, man. Get this if you can. Because with, like I was saying, shit, theology, not a lot has changed. But with plants, like, shit's really been fucked up in the last year. Not fucked up, it's been more elucidated and articulated. But the newer edition is the shit to get. I mean, really, either one good. This is actually somebody put this on LibGen. It wasn't me. Um, but uh, another video. What's up? What? I don't know. I fucking forgot to mute the mic. Anyway, oh, I would get this one. Um, like I said, hard copy is always better, and Mike Simpson gets some of the money. But if you steal it on LibGen, even just, you know, find a way, maybe ask him to get Venmo in 10 bucks. I don't fucking know, you know, because um, he's a cool guy and he's uh, actually trying to do a podcast with him. Uh, he hasn't responded. We've been emailing back and forth, but he hasn't gotten back to me yet once I asked him. But uh, but that's something where like there's a lot of new updated taxonomy because taxonomy is still changing. It's still going to change uh, as you know, there's a lot of families and taxa that haven't been sequenced yet. No one's done a molecular phylogeny on them yet. And so as, as people do that, we'll gain new insight into these relationships. So I would definitely get the new one. I mean, it's it's on LibGen. You can buy it on Amazon. I don't even know how much it is on Amazon, but uh, it's probably like 50, 60 bucks. But I mean, spend 60 bucks if you got it on something you're going to use for the next 10 years. It's not You're not wasting money, you know? Thanks. Um, yeah, what's up? Next question. Um, do you have any information on the um, Asclepius prostrata growing on the Mexican side of the river? No, man. No, it's and that's that whole side is like where that's like the base camp for coyotes, you know, <laughs> for like coyotes and smugglers and shit. And I think, you know, if they knew you were looking at plants, they probably wouldn't give a shit. But it's an area where like no one's going to think that you're there to look at plants. They're going to think you're there to like move in on their business you're trying to smuggle people too you're trying to smuggle drugs too uh you know so no i mean there's there's a whole wealth of fucking plants there astrophytum uh kaput medusa 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 however the fuck you're supposed to pronounce it in latin it doesn't matter you can pronounce it whatever the fuck you want but that's another really wild fucking cactus i mean it's a weird fucking variation on the genus astrophytum you can't, I mean, you could get there, but it's, there's a little bit more risk involved. It's just a fucking hot area, you know? And that's the, that's again, the result of poverty and inequality and all that shit that the gravy seals don't want to pretend exists. Anyway, uh, without getting into that, yeah, there's a bunch of, uh, hopefully one day shit will die down a little bit. You can go botanize there, but right now it's, no, I have no, I have no clue. I mean, there's a couple people in INAT. Lex Garcia is a cool one. He's he does a lot of, uh, he's got a lot of observations in that area. You know, I would check iNaturalist. That'd be the thing to do. Go to Explorer, type in Asclepius and type in uh, Tamaulipas, which is the state that it's in. See what comes up. Yeah, I mean, like um, with iNat, I think when it like, when the observation obscures and it places the uh, point, like a lot of the Prostrata observations from Texas go over into Tamaulipas and it, um, well, the border does, the rectangle does, but if you type in Tamaulipas in that field, it'll only give you things that have been observed in Tamaulipas. So that obscure blurry green rectangle will maybe cross into Texas, Texas, but it, it'll only give you the shit that's been observed in Tamaulipas. So yeah, but that's a cool, I mean, fucking yeah, that's a cool, but we just discovered another population of that, which I guess was known by one or two people already, but, uh, and it had a fruit, but this fucking dude I know picked it. Not a bad guy. Not 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 you know not shit on him, but he picked the fruit uh, prematurely. And I remember seeing it and I'm being like, it's not ready yet. I'll come back. And I came back and it was gone. I was like, ah fuck, motherfuck, you know. And I found, oh, I picked it. I thought it was good, great, you know. And seeds were still white. They weren't brown yet. Uh, they were still. They needed more time, you know. I was just like, oh well, oops. And they're trying to build the wall right through where that population is too. Hopefully it'll it'll stop. I mean, cause the fucking wall was just a performative effort for, uh, you know, pig dick anyways. So I don't know, but there, there's other areas they're speeding the wall up. They're like, we got to get it. These sleaze bag construction was like, we got to get it done before, uh, you know, before our time's up and Biden cancels it. So, um, 
I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's where that grows. That the one I just found is like one of my favorite places in South Texas. It's a private ranch and the dude's cool with letting people on there. So um, I found one like I was down there and I found a I found one of those liquids with the follicle had just burst open. And I thought about taking the seeds. And I was like, no, nah, I shouldn't do it. A it's, prostrata? It's, yeah. I mean, with that plant, almost it's like maybe, man, maybe you should have because for whatever reason that, you know, should have, and then give it to someone who could propagate it. Like, I know, I, I feel like, I feel like such a fucking dumbass by not doing it because like, what, after I left, I was like, wait, where's the, where are these seeds going to land? And well, habitually you shouldn't, I mean, habitually you shouldn't take seeds of rare plants unless you're going to conserve them, you know, or give them to someone who's not going to fuck up growing them. But you know, that's a good thing to keep in mind. But I mean, there's of course exceptions. I mean, I've thought about that too. I was like, like I was going to go back and get that uh, prostrata fruit for my friend, Michael Eason. Cause he works at San Antonio, San Antonio and works them a bunch. And I was like, you know, and he was like, Oh shit. Okay. I told him it was there. Like, let me know. And then I went back to get it and it was fucking gone. I was so bummed. Um, you know, but there's, there's always next year or next rain. So yeah, you know, I carry, like I said, I carry those little drug baggies around with me. Uh, that only works on dry seed. If like the fruit is still wet or the seed is like, it's a cactus seed that's still wet. I put it in the drug baggie and bring it back with me. And then of course, when I get home, I'll, you know, find a way to air it out, dry it out. I'll take it out of the baggie, put it in paper. Paper is generally better, but uh, the baggies are fine, you know? So anybody else? I received oh, uh, some seeds of various astrophytum from Mexico and I'm about to sprout them. Sourcing limestone and rocks that they prefer for how would you go about that i live in Oregon. No, they don't need to grow on limestone. no limestone except for Biggs junction yeah they don't need they don't need limestone i mean same thing with like peyote like peyote seeds and habitat only grow on limestone uh but you could grow them on anything i mean they're just you just got to provide the right conditions again it's one of those things that do they need the limestone or is that just where uh they have a competitive advantage and they're evolved to it um there's different you know, whatever, when, when anything's in cultivation, you can baby it, you can, it's not the same as environment, obviously, so you don't need limestone, you could just, what you will need is a fast draining mix and high humidity at first, uh, a friend of mine grows astrophytum from seed, I mean, I was just over at his house a few days, and we've got like trays of these fucking things, they're like bursting out of the, it's crazy, I mean, he's, nice. really, he's really figured it out, he waters them from below, so he like puts them in a tray, waters the tray, so that they don't rot up top. He doesn't even give them humidity, but like when I've grown small spineless cacti before, I've kept them covered with like saran wrap to keep the humidity up. But then you run the risk of that first month or two, it's a really fine line between, are they gonna rot or are they gonna dry out? Because before they've bulked up and turned into that battery that cacti are, and they've got enough carbs and moisture stored up, they're really sensitive. They can dry out easily too, you know? Uh, so it's kind of like that fine line Ways to mitigate it are just, yeah, grow them in like a humidity dome, uh, water them from beneath. So like the capillary action of water draws the water up. You're not getting that tissue uh, wet. Um, there was a soil mix some dude told me for astrophytum, forget what it was, but there was like almost no organic material. It was like perlite or mineral based. Yeah, just mineral based, like I uh, forget what exactly he used. I mean, you can use a little bit of peat if you got more heat, but if it's only like 60 or 70 degrees in your growing environment, you want to stay away from the organic materials. But again, it, that's everything changes. Like when you're in a place where it's like 85 degrees and humid, one, you're not going to need to cover those plants. And two, uh, you can use a little bit more peat because their metabolism is going so much faster than it would be. Uh, you know, plant that you have to think about the metabolism of the plant, how it's consuming, how it's photosynthesizing and then consuming its own energy, right? And, and plants that are from tropical and subtropical environments need warmer temperatures because that's what their metabolism is adapted to. And that's why when you bring them to lower temperatures, they tend to rise because they slow down. They're just, they're in effect living a sedentary lifestyle. They don't have the temperatures to metabolize and photosynthesize. And so they can't produce the compounds that fight off fungi as well as they might otherwise. So it's, you know, everything changes when temperatures change. But then again, if you get too hot, like above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, low phosphorus shuts down. It's not, it, it, it's not photosynthesizing, not actively photosynthesizing. 
Maybe it'll start photosynthesizing again later in the day when temps cool off. Maybe it won't photosynthesize for a few days because it's in a fucking heat wave. It just depends, you know? So then the, the, if you want to read more about that, another great fucking book, I didn't put this, Peter Raven's Biology of Plants, also available on LibGen. Uh, don't start reading it from beginning to end. Just look through the table of contents and look up different chapters. There's some fucking great shit. It's like the plant physiology textbook. It's fucking awesome, you know? And you can pick it up anywhere and start reading, you know? So um, I live in like Cook, Kane County border. And because you're from the area, I was wondering what your uh, favorite wild area is. Not like a botanical garden, but. Oh, uh, Wolf Road. I mean, there's a bunch. Wolf Road, Prairie, Braidwood, Dunes. That's further south. Well, yeah, that's closer south to you. Uh, <clears throat> you want to get to uh, in the summer, if it hasn't rained in a while and the water is low enough, you could wade across the uh, Kankakee River, go to Langham Island, check out that weird Iliamna, which is super easy to grow from seed. Super fucking easy. Prairie Moon Nursery sells it, but, you know, each plant produces tons of seed. You could you can go over and take a couple, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Take a couple fruits, yeah. give it the hot water treatment. Man, I don't even need to, but I, I would, wouldn't hurt, you know? Don't get it boiling, but get it hot, you know, too hot to touch. Uh, and then just germinate. I've germinated a ton of those uh, plants. They come up like weeds, you know, if you give them what they need. And then they, they need full sun. Um, Langham Island's good, Braidwood Dunes. There's a bunch of sand prairies. I mean, go to Google Terrain and... Uh, or Google Maps and just look at any green area and then zoom in on it and see if it's a nature preserve or a fucking golf course. If it's a golf course, go dump some garbage over there. Just kidding, just kidding. And uh, <laughs> and uh, if it's a nature preserve, go check it out and do like a species inventory. You'll see shit you never saw before. There's some really cool prairies down in Markham too. Nice blue collar suburb of what Markham. Was the name of that, uh, what was the name of that plant you mentioned? Sorry. Uh, Iliamna, I-L-I-A-M-N-A. Remota. It's another weird, uh, narrow endemic, only known from that one island and supposedly on the side of some train tracks in Indiana. And that's it. Nowhere else in the world. Really? Yes. Yeah, remember the cotton family? Uh, it's getting crowded. out. It was getting crowded out on that island by uh, Japanese honeysuckle invasives and quite a few invasives. And then bunch of people started going over there like 15, 20 years ago and burning. They're doing prescribed burns and weeding out the honeysuckle and all the other invasives and now they've they've really done a fucking great job i mean there's all the stuff there is thriving now but that's probably a plant i mean it's so easy to grow that's a plant that should be in every fucking midwest garden i don't know why it's not like i don't know why i never heard of it until you know i don't know why i never saw it at chicago botanic garden which maybe it was kind of lame i don't know why i ever you know i think morton arboretum has it but uh you know, it should be a much more common plant than it is. It's so fucking easy to grow. It doesn't require any special type of soil. It just needs full sun, just full sun. That's it. Well, there's a couple of boggy areas and stuff near me that nobody goes to. So I'll uh, see about helping it along. Well, it doesn't like bogs. It likes fast draining soil. But, uh, but yeah, oh, I mean, sorry. I'm... What's that? Okay. Yeah. I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can email me after too if you need, you know, uh, any deets or anything. So, any, anybody else got any more questions? All right, you can do another video. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm doing this because um, someone hooked me up with a <laughs> with like a pro Zoom account, and they're leaving uh, to go back to the Dominican Republic tomorrow. So this is, you know, and she was cool enough to just be like, "Yeah, I'll help you out." And she she helped me, you know, do this. I'll do I'll put this stuff together and maybe at some point I will but if I do it'd be uh it'd be limited to like a hundred uh a hundred people I think the pro zoom account is like 150 bucks when I looked into it it's like it's a lot of money uh you can get it for like 15 bucks a month really and you can get it to they got like a 300 person limit or what uh I'm not sure but when I went pro it was like 15 bucks maybe I'm wrong yeah, yeah, that's what I would need to pay attention to is the the limit of the, you know, how many people can attend. I think only one and a half of us has to pay. I'd only be limited like a hundred people otherwise, but that's fine. I mean, like we're like seventy five right now, you know, like half the people dipped out. <laughs> I don't. I'm surprised there's this many people left. Three hours is a long fucking time of time. Anytime I do these presentations, I'm always blown away how fucking long I can go before. I mean, I'm not like 
I got to pee, but aside from that, I just said, yeah, enjoy talking about this so much. And yeah, I, I like pe getting people excited about it and, you know, whatever. Um, any more questions or is that it? Yeah. Uh, about um, that support you found in. Oh, shit. Go ahead. We, there'll be time for everybody. Uh, uh, the Sephora that you found at the Utah Arizona border. Yeah. I was wondering if you like have any areas where you could find it because I'm like in the the res up here and it's just not that far. Oh, just drive, just drive down there. I mean, it's it's from like a main. It's you wouldn't see it now because it's winter, but in you know, like you know, like Mormons and like private areas and. Uh no, I think it's it's it only grows in those dunes. It, it might you know what. I don't know. I, I I would have to look again, but again, look up on INAT. It's not a rare plant. It'll be listed. Yeah. Use the explore feature on INAT, see where else it's been observed. Uh, and barring that, oh fuck, this modem is about to fall. Hopefully I don't disconnect myself again. Uh, barring that, um, it'll be, you know, you could check uh, SINET, S-E-I-N-E-T. It's like the Botanical Research Institution. Um, you know, so it would be there too, but I, I think it might be, it might occur in a couple other places. It's not, it's not as rare as that milkweed, but definitely that's the easiest. You should go to that. Does it only uh, grow under sand? Does it only, uh, I think it only grows in sand. Yeah. I'd be surprised oh, okay, if it grew anywhere else, but, um, but yeah, I would definitely, you should go there anyway. It's cool. And it's, you know, the like fucking ATV guys, you know, are, well, they're restricted to a certain portion of it. They can't, they're not supposed to drive where the milkweed and all the other rare plants are, but they fucking do, you know. They're freedom. <laughs> uh, but yeah, check check it out. It's right near one of the main parking areas, and uh, there's a ton of cool shit there. I mean, yeah, that's the spot to be in June. You know, if you want the more remote areas, you go to like the northeast end of that. Um, you go to the northeast end of that uh, little national park or mine, whatever the fuck it is, state park. So. Anybody else? Who else had a question? I've got one. So I was, uh, as I've watched the videos, I've I've kind of been wondering if, I mean, now that we've brought up the iNaturalist sort of app and website, is this how you're mostly finding the kind of interesting locations with these rare plants or just kind of good places in general to find uh, plants in your area? Nah, well, sometimes. Or if you're just like getting word of mouth, or if you're just kind of going out in random places and just hoping you run across something, because you know, like you showed the that fritillaria. I mean, that's a a genus that I'm kind of interested in too. Yeah. And I'm around some serpentine stuff uh, in the East Bay. How do you so find rare spots? I mean, that's kind of the you know that's the thing. If it's rare enough, it's obscure. You got to find word of mouth. Uh, that population, one of those populations, was actually found by a guy named Roger Raish, uh, who I'm friends with. Um, I don't know if he's the biggest fan of the videos. He's kind of a, you know, he's kind of a a square, great guy, but he's kind of like the profanity offends him and shit, whatever. But he found that uh, on his own in like the eighties, you know, and he just, there no GPS. He just had really good location info. And then a friend of mine uh, went back based on a description of the area and searched and searched and finally found it. <clears throat> and that's actually really cool. I mean, I showed you two different populations there. One of them is literally like 30 feet across. It's like 30 feet in diameter. That's it. Nowhere else for whatever fucking weird reason. That's the only area that it grows. Um, but, uh, the other population is a little bit more spread out, but but my friend found that and then told me about it. He's like, I just found a Roger Raish's, you know, Felcata population. I was like, oh shit, I gotta go check it out. And that was the spot that's trespassing that's, you know, the rednecks there that's, you know, I'm sure he would fucking hate the idea of anyone coming on his land to look at a plant. But, uh, you know, he's got like signs up and shit now. He, I think he knew we were going there and then the next day he put up signs and he put up a he like has some dogs that he just keeps outside. It's fucking brutal. He doesn't live there, but he owns the property. He just keeps these dogs like now they're like permanent residents. All that shit burned though, so I don't know what uh, I don't know what the status of it is. I mean, it just burned, you know, seven months ago. The whole fucking area went up. Wouldn't affect the fritillaria, but other locations, you know, some they're like that 
Asclepius, I just found on my own. I was I was looking at the at a at the habitat looked right, and I was like, well, this is too. There's too much vegetation around, but over there it's like bare sand. So I went, and I was like, oh shit, there it is. Um, other spots, yeah, friends have found. Like my friend Matt, the sheriff Woody goes out. He's, he he'll hike up in the middle of fuck. He's like a he loves hiking. He's like the surfer dude version of a hiker. So he'll just like hiking 20 miles in a day is nothing to him like out and back. So, and he'll find all kinds of rare shit. He might've found two new species of monkey flowers. Um, yeah. Word of mouth. You just, you come up on it. You know, if you're obsessed with something and you, you are really into it, you figure out where to find it. So there's multiple venues, but it's mostly, yeah, for like the rare shit because it's obscured word of mouth, older barium vouchers, um, et cetera. So, or just know what the habitat looks like, you know, which sometimes you can even figure out from looking at a satellite map. For the burned areas, are you just like parking on the side of the road and like walking in? Because I want to go up there, but I don't know where I can like park. Uh, you just find spots to park, uh, you know, places you don't think cops will fuck with your car. The burn, I mean, like the Tano Ridge, that was, that's like a, you know, 14, 15 mile hike in and out. So you yeah, should go sure. at like eight or nine, but. And we weren't supposed to be there either. That was, you know, people were whining yeah. about that on the fucking, it's clouds. Well, yeah, it's close because of liability. I'm not going to fucking sue if a tree falls on me. You know, fuck off. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you just, you park wherever. If you, preferably, you don't want to have to hike that bar. But if, if you're like in a fucking Honda Fit or something, you're kind of up shit creek. You're going to have to get used to hiking. You know, it just, it just depends. You know, but again, that's the point of masturbating. Look at the map and, you know, see what's, uh, what's available, what, what the what the area's like, so. Okay, cool, I'm just gonna drive up into Big Basin somewhere and try to find somewhere to park. There's just, I'm like scared of fucking people with guns. I don't wanna get shot. No, don't be, I mean, <laughs> they, I don't think in most cases, like a friend of mine who's a herper is always like, yeah, it's a, and he does it in Texas and he'll be trespassing and they'll be like, it's amazing what telling someone that you're looking for snakes, the, how, how quickly it changes them and same thing with plants you know the only thing i worry about is like a lot of you know things are so polarized now people think you're looking for plants they're that they're going to be more not in california but out here so much they're going to be like oh you're a plant you're a fucking hippie or antifa or what you know there's just more of a political association with plants it's fucking stupid but that's the nature of this you know shithole situation we're in right now so maybe say snakes but just tell them whatever you know tell them you're looking for whatever if they do catch you in so many cases they don't you know i mean you're not doing anything wrong really like you're not being unethical like proper private property laws are not ethics they just shit people made up you're not doing anything wrong and if you go into it with that attitude it's whatever you know i got thrown out of some fucking track i was running in last night. i like to run every day I had to hop a fence to get in there because it's everything's gate kept around this fucking area it's depressing security rolled up and i just was like yeah what's up and i just talked to him i was like yeah i came in here how'd you get in a hot defense it's, you know i didn't think i got in it's, everything's locked I'm just running you know and he was like okay we'll just get out of here and i was like yeah fuck all right i'm not doing anything wrong i mean maybe it's a law and he was like well we can call the cops and blah blah I was like, yeah 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 all right the cops show up i mean what were they gonna do if they take me to jail for fucking being in a track running i mean i was in fucking running shorts i'd laugh my ass off and i go to jail i don't give a fuck i've been there before <laughs> it's you're not gonna you're not the point is you're not gonna go to prison for it it's maybe a small citation or something which is a pain in the ass but but don't let the threat of you know legality prevent you from going to cool spots so yeah it's, I'm like, not it's different though but you know that's a different thing and in california they can't they have to have signs of it. there's no no trespassing signs they can't even press charges and they're going to be unlikely to shoot you unless they think you're stealing shit, you know, so. There's just a lot of people that like, they're very touchy because like everything burned down and I don't know if it's like people's private property, like I'll fucking trespass, I don't care, but just, yeah, there's a lot of people that are really like on edge right now. Yeah, I mean, try to avoid where there looks like there was a structure, you know, I don't, okay, I don't know. Good. Yeah, big basin, I haven't been there in a while, but if it's just, a lot of the times things are shut down, especially in air, fire areas because of the danger. There's nothing to be careful about too because trees can fall on you, but they have to put those there because of liability issues. So I always encourage trespassing. What do you do about putting that stuff on INET or whatever? Just I obscure, obscure everything now. I, mean, I, I obscure almost everything now unless I want some somebody to find it because 
I think there's a lot of people just because of the channel or whatever that lurk that I my iNaturals page. And so I don't even want to blow up a lot of my spots. So I obscure them. But in some cases, I think, you know, if it's not rare and it's not something that people are li likely to poach, uh, I like having people know those things are out there. I like people, uh, you know, having a reason to go check things out and, you know, get excited. It's a pleasant escapism from, uh, you know, the dystopia. So. Anybody else? Uh, so yeah. yeah, I've. Yeah. Oh. Oh shit! This might hold on. I gotta plug this fucking uh, laptop, and it might croak. If it goes out. Sorry. Hold on. Uh. You still there? Oh, okay. Something fell out. But okay charging all right yeah what's up got a little darker but so so yeah i had a question about um propagating i think it's a cymopterus uh, fenderellii right so it's a cymop and um and it's it's i know your stance on foraging it sucks and i thought about it before and i want to try to cultivate it so what you know uh if you know what? Where do where do I go to try to you know figure out how to get this thing to sprout? Uh, I would just well, you could go to Google Scholar and see if there's been any papers written on the germination. There's probably not, but um, but you know, I, I want to make clear, like I don't, I my own personal opinions on foraging, whatever. I, I mean, I like the plants that have been through the ten thousand years of human selective pressure, but it's it's harmless if it's done in the in a harmless way right but it's when people just go out and they want to just get that consumer attitude and rip everything out when it's you know just for the sake whatever it doesn't it doesn't matter but if you want to cultivate some optics, that would be cool and you could even breed ones if you do long enough that are more advantageous uh for human consumption you know more bigger leaves whatever the fuck to find out where to germinate it though i would just look up just germinating the cymopterus genus and short of that, I would just try, uh, if it's from an area that gets cold winters, just try cold stratifying it in a bag of moist, not soaking wet, but moist sand in the fridge, enough that some of that moisture is gonna, you know, permeate that seed coat uh, for a few weeks, for four weeks. If it's from like a desert area, it doesn't need, stratification generally always improves things. Cold water always generally kind of improves uh, things, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I would just try it out, man. And if it's look at the soil, if it's if it's from a desert area, I'm not familiar with that species, but from a desert area where there's not much organic material in the soil, try a mineral, more mineral mix. You know, if it's like a desert plant, that's desert plants tend to rot easily easier in, in cultivation if they get too much moisture, if the substrate is too wet. So um <clears throat> let me try turning this light on. So I would just, I would start there, you know? I mean, the really the best way to do it sometimes is just to try. And maybe that light doesn't do shit. Maybe you won't get any germination. Maybe it'll work out really well. Uh, just try it and see, be your own fucking scientist, you know? Yeah, cool. So uh, anybody so, else? So I've been out several times and uh, uh, when I find like a new species and I'm totally stoked, stoked about it and then I go to look it up and then there's not really that much information on Wikipedia or, or any other sites else that I'm looking at. Are, uh, for specific species, are you usually looking at scientific papers or are there any other resources that you'd recommend that are good for just, I don't know, learning more about the plant, about its ecology and stuff or yeah, man, that's, that's, a, that's a problem that that I really, you know, first encountered a lot when I was getting into this. And that's, you know, uh, my friend, Matt, the guy that does indefensive plants, that's what he mostly does. I mean, he like he's been in grad school for the last four years in Champaign. He's not traveling to these areas to see him. Uh, he just is really good at doing research and figuring stuff out and then putting it, digesting it into a really easily digestible, uh, articulate way with good photos and i mean he's, he's excellent at that you know um so you just gotta 
and I've always been good at doing research. Even when I was riding fucking freight trains, I was always good at figuring out where the fucking yard was, when the time, when the trains left, what they looked like, you know, whatever. Um, so it's just, you know, you're, if you're obsessed about something and that's everywhere, you just find a way. Google Scholar is your friend, scholar.google.com. I mean, even if you don't understand 90% of the words in there, there's going to be little bits that you will understand. And in the abstract, you know, the introductory piece, whatever, um, and there's there's always an ecology there. I mean, certain genera, certain families just have e ecologies that are kind of written in there, like the footnote, like this plant normally grows. A lot of members of this family grow on limestone. A lot of members of this family grow on serpentine. A lot of uh, this family has been really successful in the deserts. So there's always, to get more of that story, I would do, yeah, Google Scholar, Wikipedia can be good. Uh, if some schmuck wrote a book on the the genus because they love it you know, there's info there um, nothing really beats going out to see it and kind of make observations you know like an evolutionary detective or ecological detective but but scholar.google.com is definitely your friend you know cool thanks yeah sure anybody else um so around where i live well all over the united states the um my land is Altissima, the tree of heaven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is a massive issue. Um, and I'm near Philly. So we recently got inundated with spotted, spotted lanternflies, gigantic leaf hoppers. Mm -hmm. And it just so turns out that in Southeast Asia, where these things originate, um, so does the tree of heaven. Mm -hmm. So, in your opinion, well, and they they brood on them, and they, you know, it's essentially replication of their um, natural habitat. So, tree of heaven. I'm um, not familiar with spotted lanternflies. Tree of heaven is a host plant, or one of a few host plants. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Spotted spotted lanternflies are these big leaf hoppers. They're really pretty. It's a shame, but they're pretty destructive to crops. Um, yeah. And we put all this effort into spraying down with pesticides and making sure all of the lantern flies are dead when we have this massive population of host plants. You think we should be focusing more on the host plants instead of just bombing the area with pesticides? I mean, bombing an area with pesticides, again, it's that sledgehammer when you need a scalpel thing. I mean, it's, you know, I, I had like a, I was growing a bunch of shit in my greenhouse once and I had white flies all over like different species of salvia I was growing. I, I was growing like, you know, 20 different species of these Central American salvias. And so I tried the organic pesticides, the pyrethrins, the quote organic, I tried everything. And the white flies would get knocked out, they'd always come back, but then none of the other bugs would be around. I was like, this is fucking stupid. Why am I doing this? What finally changed things was when I got, uh, some species of spiders showed up somehow in my greenhouse and then it thrived. There was a big food source for it, all those white flies. Now there's this fucking spiders are everywhere and I barely have any white flies anymore and they do great, you know? But but actually before that, I stopped spraying the pyrethrins because I realized I was killing everything and then just started physically spraying uh, the undersides of leaves with water. And I got like a little mister attachment. So every, every other day, whenever I'd be out there watering, I just spray the undersides of the leaves, which is where the white flies hang out and fuck them all up, you know, probably kill a lot of them because once they get their wings wet, they're done. Um, and then just let the spiders come in. I mean, it's always with Ilanthus, you know, we, we used to climb that tree all the time, used to get on abandoned buildings and shit when I was a kid in Chicago. But I mean, it's always a good idea to get rid of Ilanthus, man. I mean, it's not so much a problem out West you get it in some areas, but it, it's generally too dry for it. Our climate is, but in areas where you got those summer, uh, summer rain, uh, yeah, Atlantis does well. And that the way to do it is just, yeah, cut it and then spot apply, uh, herbicide, you know, but pesticides are so fucked, man. I mean, really, and, and it's so crazy because it's, you kill everything and a lot of insects you want around, you know, I mean, if it's bad where it's like malaria and you got to, spray for mosquitoes okay i understand it's not ideal i'm actually in favor of that fucking genome that <laughs> the suicide generation uh gmo mosquitoes man it's uh you know it couldn't be any worse than we're already fucking up the planet that's really bad reasoning but you know i, I also understand how the genetics of it work it seems kind of cool but anyway that that aside i would i would just I, yeah always get rid of atlantis i mean 
it's such a fucking it's funny because it grows out of a you know roofs of abandoned buildings but it can be a it's just kind of a fucker of a plant so and, and i don't know the actual ecology if it's like plays a certain essential part in the life cycle of that insect but just get rid of it anyway fuck it someone just chatted asking what the negative impact of lantern flies are um they're they're crop eaters essentially um and they're um nymphs put off this sticky resin that gets all over everything it's just disgusting um, and they multiply by the thousands they're just they're bad for everything really yeah damn man but, yeah, and of course, eventually something will evolve to specialize on them or eat them. But how long will that take, and how many extinctions will they cause in the meantime? Yeah, not as fast as they take over everything. Right, same thing with other invasive species, you know. So, uh, yeah, next person. Hey, so uh, I was out in the Mojave the other day, and I'm sorry if uh, this might have been your episode about philisma, but I was looking around and I was wondering, like how how did you how do you find them like they're underground right so well yeah well they come up they surface uh one species was up already uh the more common one arenaria and sonore was about to emerge but um but i it wasn't up yet and the way i found it was like the same way you find a truffle i just i looked at the host plant looked around the host plant which was ambrosia and saw a spot where like the soil was pushed up and then excavated it a little bit and there it was i found like two or three more you know but that it's funny because that that area is fucking like you know it, it's like QAnon atv heaven right it's fucking hilarious you know i mean it's it was horrible yeah like south of that road it's just like some of the fucking worst people <laughs> some of the worst people america could produce and then yeah. the road it's all yeah I, it's like they i feel like they're like you know, fucking glaring at you and calling you a fag for like stopping to look at plants. I mean, it's that kind of shit for brain. And the same thing they do when they see you wearing like a mask, you know, they're like, oh. It's I just- had I had someone stop me and, and ask me why I was wearing a mask in my car. Yeah, like, why do you give a yeah. fuck? Because I like the way it looks, fuck face, because I want to yeah. actually want to take pictures. And, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> in reality, maybe you're just too lazy to take it off. Whatever, I don't give a fuck. I mean, the country the culture here is so fucking stupid now i mean it's just whatever but but yeah that's uh that's one way to find it. it'd be cool to find new populations of it on sand in across the border in mexico uh and that area is not too hectic it's pretty chill you can get across but anyway yeah i don't know you just uh look for where it's pushing up soil but uh also you know keep that on the dl too because that's a plant that could get easily knocked out by more attention even well-meaning attention drawn to it so got it thank you Mm -hmm. all right one or two more questions then i gotta pee i got a question about uh serpentine yeah so does serpentine only occur like in specific subduction zones or do uh does it have like erratics basically like will you find it in um in a more random area like maybe brought down by a river or something? Uh, yeah, you'll find cobbles, but in areas where the the country rock, the base rock is, is not base, but the that's not a, I don't want to confuse it with basement rock, but in areas where like the general region is all serpentine, it's always put there by subduction zones. But yeah, you could have maybe like there's a serpentine exposure a few miles up, up uh, river that was placed there by a subduction zone 70 million years ago and then the rivers washed it down but in areas where like the but in that case it's not the country rock it's just cobbles that have been washed and moved by uh the river they're alluvial de- deposits you know and any place it's the actual rock that is beneath the soil and composes the majority of the substrate they're put there by subduction or abduction zones so subduction zones going down abductions where Instead of going down, it gets kind of slapped up on top of the continental crust. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. So, one more speaking some of your cues about uh, illegal planting and trying to get some more just plants in my local area. I'm in Central Texas, and I have some species of Quercus and Ilex going, but 
I mean, the, the resources that I have for like what I really should be out there planting and what's really good for local ecology and what's really beneficial. Like, I really don't know where to begin there. What do you mean to find out what's, what, what you want more diversity basically in terms of like stuff to grow? Yeah, exactly. And I know like trees and shrubs are a good place to start, but I mean, that's really, I have a pretty narrow, uh, you know, kind of expertise there. And I really, I need to expand my knowledge and, you know, gather more seeds, collect more seeds. And I know like stuff that comes up, just collect and spread is beneficial, but I really like to, you know, target a few specific things and things, plants that are really beneficial for pollinators and things like that. Do you have any resources? You want a good cast of species. You want to figure out what the rest, what are some more members of that plant community? So you could do a number of things. You could go to iNaturalist and explore. Uh, most of the stuff that comes up is going to be native. Normally, if people post some shit that's planted, um, uh, it, it, it'll be removed. If it's invasive and wasn't planted, you can go to the species page. It'll say where it originated. It's invasive. Uh, iNaturalist, I mean, really, the explore feature is fucking great. Just type in a family you like, pea family, Fabaceae, hit your county. Boom, you get a list of everything. You know, it's Asteraceae, same thing. Salvia family, Lamiaceae, same thing. You could also uh, do your own fucking species list. You know, go out to these preserves, uh, what little crumbs of habitat have been left, inventory them, survey them. Uh, you'll also be learning shit that you haven't seen before. Like there's a bunch of cool penstemons that grow around Fort Worth, Dallas area. Uh, there's a bunch of cool um, limestone composites that grow on there, like that Silphium albiflorum and stuff. So you'll you just go out and you'll see You'll see new shit you don't know. You'll type it into INAT. Either the artificial intelligence will identify it for you or somebody else will. There, you've just learned a new species and now you can just go back to whenever it's done flowering, see if the seed is ready yet, if the fruit's ready yet, whatever, and then collect your own seed. Or there's probably native seed, you know, native mail or seed sources that would sell you seed. So that's really the best way, getting out in the field, checking it out, making a list. My list is on iNaturalist. I don't, it's not like I'm out there with a notebook. I just have a list I can type in family, uh, the location, and then there's another field where you can click observer me, only my observations. I can see everything that I've observed there. And, you know, that's helpful if I forget like a genus name or a species name. So, yeah, but I would do that. I mean, you learn your native flora and then you can grow all that shit. And that's the best way to get to know a plant is to grow it, you know, and you're like, you see how it behaves and what it responds to and uh you know if it likes shade or sun when it's young or when you know it's fucking cool it's a really rewarding thing to do and then you go when you grow a shit ton and you have too many and then you go give them to people or, or yeah sneak them into little landscape plant things or wherever you know i would just give them to people give them to other people that are in the native gardening in texas you know there's a shit ton of cool plants here yeah right on and there's way too many invasive ornamentals everywhere and i'm just anything you could do right <laughs> yeah yeah, there's a, yeah. So just, you know, I think that's one of the thing about Texas that kind of blows my mind is like they, they got such a cool flora here, but these people plant fucking crepe myrtles and like, oh, like I, if I see another crepe myrtle, I'm going to vomit, you know, and just like goose drum, which is plant, which is like terribly invasive. It's still being sold at like the Home Depot garden center, you know, and that kind of keeps in line with like all the unimaginative fucking dead on the inside culture, the culture of the lawn. The culture of like, oh, it's hard work. It's hard work. Yeah, like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a good boy and work 30 years at a job I hate that doesn't pay me enough, and I'll get a little pat on the head. And you know, these people get older and turn 60 and realize the fucking system threw them overboard and they're fucked now. And now they're really pissed about it. But you know, unfortunately, like the Facebook MAGA crowd got them first before anyone that could, you know, tell them the real sense of what happened. So it's. There's this whole, I mean, there's this whole darkness that I synonymize with these fucking plant species. And it's not the fault of the plant species. Like Goostrum is probably cool where it's native. Really cool member of the olive family, Oleaceae, you know. Uh, Oleander's cool. It's a cool member of the milkweed family, Apostinaceae, where it's native. But I've just been beaten over the head with them by these bland, you know, spiritually dead human landscapes. And I'm just like, oh, God, I can't fucking do it now. So... Anyway, uh, unsolicited rant. One more question. Anybody? Uh, are you a? 
I got in here late. Was there a PDF or anything, or are you just going to post this to Patreon later? Oh, yeah. There, uh, well, there was like a Google Slides presentation. And it's, oh, okay. It'll be written out, all the keywords and shit. And yeah, you could you get something out of that. Um, I'll put it, I got to wait for it to finish on, on, a, on Zoom, and then I'll put it up on Unlisted on, a, on YouTube. Because YouTube's too much of a fucking toilet to put something like that. You know what I mean? You just get a bunch of bored fucking birds just you know trolls and whatever so and this is this will probably put a lot of people to sleep to the general audience so but it'll be there unlisted on patreon and if if you paid for a class and missed it and don't want to do the patreon just hit me just email me or dm me on instagram you know hey can i get that link and i'll give it to you so awesome thank you all right all right thanks for coming everybody really i appreciate it i gotta pee really bad and if you got questions just fucking you can email me and uh you know, if I don't, I may not respond and because I'm normally not around a computer. I'm typing on this thing and I get fucking pissed off if I have to, you know, I misspell words all the time and just sound like a jackass. It's hard to type on these fucking keypads. But I'll normally, if you have a question, straight question, I'll try and answer it. May not respond with like five paragraphs, but I will try and answer your question. So I always love plant ideas. So anyway, hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciate this. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go fuck yourself. 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 Go fuck yourself.